John and Gene, you there? Yep, we're here, George. Thanks. Thanks, guys. I think this is going to be fun. Um, John, I want you to set the stage, set the scene, sort of. Uh, 20 years ago, you know, it's hard to believe now that people didn't know about Area 51, but, I mean, you knew about it back then. You were uh, floating around on the edge to see whatever strange things were being test flown out there, and a few other aviation buffs knew about it, and people who worked there knew about it, but largely the world didn't know about it, and uh, it was still a secret and, and was hard, was pretty much unknown in the world of ufology, right? Right. My friends, uh, I had a couple of friends that flew the SR-71, and, of course, I hung around Van Nuys, and uh, every Monday morning, Lockheed would uh, depart with their three constellations with all the engineers. Uh, this is in the uh, 60s, early 60s, or the uh, middle 60s. Uh, and then on Friday afternoon, uh, they would all, the three constellations would come in all in trail formation and land. And those were the engineers and uh, that worked up there. And I never knew exactly where it was, except it wasn't too hard to figure out, you know, somewhere in the Nevada test site. And the way I figured it out is I was doing some soaring out of a little place near Pahrump, and um, one of the guys there, we got talking about um, um, the test site, and he made the comment, he said, uh, uh, yeah, I've been up there, but no Area 51 stuff. And that's the first time. I heard Area 51, and of course, from then it wasn't too hard to track it down and find out that Area 51 made Groom, uh, uh, meant Groom Lake. I thought it was the Tonopah test range, but it wasn't. It was Groom Lake. You started uh, poking around out there, taking photos, some amazing photos. No, I mean, no one is ever going to get that close again uh, of the facility itself. I've used them in a couple of documentaries, and and uh, I guess you stumbled onto information about the existence of the stealth fighter, which is how you came to KLAS and our attention and helped us break that story. Yeah, and of course, you know, I still tell the story about the F-19, which was uh, co-produced with the, uh, with the F-117A. The 117A was uh, covered for the F-19. The F-19, they built 62 of them, and it's still a secret, and people still don't believe it, and I have friends that, you know, worked on it and uh, and saw it fly, and, uh, of course, the Navy used the bulk of them, and some went to Israel. But, yeah, I've got those black and white photos I took in 19, I believe it was 77, and I went right down to the dry lake bed. That's when there was no guard shack. All there was was a, uh, a little booth but nobody was in the booth, and we could look across the dry lake bed, and that's when I got that picture of the MiG-21 that was sitting outside the uh, one of the hangars. And if you go to the site where uh, uh, Special Projects is, they have that photo there, and that was set, and they said that's the only known photo of a MiG at Groom Lake, and that was yeah. my photo. Man, I, yeah, we'll never, no one will ever get that close again here. I'm sure that you made a lot of friends by by publishing that photo or, or li- releasing it to the public. Gene, had you ever heard of Area 51 before you met Bob Lazar and John? Yeah, I saw a young, budding tele-journalist named George Knapp do a program <laughs> on it <laughs> uh, in Las Vegas. But that's the first I heard of it when you did that little local on-the-record television show. You look back at it now, how uh, how how far this story has gone, how it's changed, and how many people all over the world know about Area 51. It's really hard to remember a time, um, at least for most people, when it wasn't so widely known, when it wasn't so iconic. Right. When we, when Bob took us out there to see the disc test, not that we necessarily want to jump right in there yet, but uh, it was as desolate as the place could be. We we took an RV, and in a, in a, even in a vehicle of that size, we were just uh, engulfed by desert and night sky. There wasn't a light or a human being as far as the eye could see. And after you broke Bob Lazar's story, I would say, what was it, about 12 months, there were actually tour buses taking, you know, tours of people out to Area 51 to show them where Groom Lake was. Well, you saw my stories, but before then, before you had talked to Bob, had you ever heard of the place? Uh, no, not, no. Not well, no, wait, but, uh, Gene, didn't you say you watched On the Record? Yeah. Well, George and I talked about that a year before. Well, know. that's what I said when okay. I saw you guys on, okay. on the record. I, I, all right, I'll tell you what, guys. That, I had never heard of it. We're going to take a break. When we come back, I want to get into the story of what you saw 20 years ago tonight. Uh, we're going into the break with Sammy Hagar, who can't seem to drive 55. Stay with us, everyone, for Coast to Coast AM. We're talking with Gene Huff and John Lear about what happened uh, and what it started uh, March 22nd, 1989, 20 years ago tonight, when they went out into the desert at the suggestion of a guy named Bob Lazar and watched a test flight of something amazing. When we come back, we're going to get into specifics about what they saw that night and what they think it uh, represented. Stay with us on Coast to Coast AM.
Welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Knapp, joined by Gene Huff and John Lear, talking about the origins of the Area 51 story, how it all began. Uh, Gene, why don't you tell me how you met Bob Lazar? Uh, back then I was working at a place called National Appraisal Service down on Eastern Avenue in Las Vegas, and Bob owned the, back then, this was prior to digital cameras and uh, good appraisal software, so real estate appraisals were still typed out, and uh, actual 35-millimeter photos were taped or pasted in the pages of a real estate appraisal, and Bob Lazar owned the photo processing lab that serviced all the residential real estate appraisers in Las Vegas, so he was Bob the photo guy. Well, this was before he's Bob the UFO guy. Right, right. Well, he was still a pretty eclectic fellow. I mean, he'd, <laughs> he'd show up for photo deliveries in a, in a Honda with a jet engine in it, so he wasn't your your normal guy. He, he looked like a scientist and was certainly an interesting guy, even if he owned the photo lab. And, and uh, you know, not everybody drives a car with a jet engine around Las Vegas, but certainly not in 1985. And you were sort of instrumental in, uh, in uh, making the link from Bob to John Lear. Right. Uh, I had seen John on On the Record with you and, and was really interested. I mean, John had a lot of UFO history. Uh, would talk about Richard Nixon was in the know and uh, the late Jackie Gleason had a house shaped like a UFO in Florida or something like that. Did I remember that right, John? Yeah. Yeah. He uh, was a, a, col- a big collector of, um, of UFO memorabilia. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just strange how it happened. I had, had, had talked to Bob and um, Bob's then wife, Tracy, whose father uh, wor- was still working down at Los Alamos. He worked on the uh, explosives that implode and compress the atomic material and atomic bomb. So he actually worked on implosions down at Los Alamos. And, and uh, I, so I had at first talked to Tracy, Bob's wife, and then she had told me Bob had worked at Los Alamos, and he was a physicist. And um, I started telling her about seeing this guy John Lear on, on the record and and uh, about the UFOs, and he had mentioned that there was that people in Los Alamos were in the know. And when Bob heard that, of course, the first thing he wanted to do was prove that he knew more than everybody else and that, you know, he had never heard about this Los Alamos. But then when he started inquiring to some people with uh, – top secret security clearance down at Los Alamos that he knew he found some substance to some of the things John was talking about on your show. John, you came into the TV station, KLAS-TV, where I work, uh, and tried to interest my mentor uh, and friend, uh, the late Ned Day, in looking at a pile of UFO documents. And you had some credibility with the TV station because you had helped Ned and our station break the story about the existence of the stealth fighter out there in the Nevada desert, which was an awfully big story. That was Ned. a really interesting day because I, you know, Ned and I were good friends, and, I, you know, I tipped him off to this stealth fighter and stuff like that. And when I told him about this flying saucer thing, he blew me off. He said, it's not possible, John. I would have known. I didn't know you were standing right behind me. And as I started to walk out, you said, hey, John, uh, but I want to see some of your stuff. And that's how it all started. And um, and in the we did a show called On the Record, and uh, one of the shows that airs at like six o'clock in the morning on a Sunday that nobody watches, and it's a city councilman would be on, and there's John Lear unveiling his uh, his beliefs about UFOs and government cover ups and things, and all of a sudden the phone's ringing off the hook, and people are paying attention and calling me up, and hey, when are you going to have that guy on again? So we had him on again, had him on a third time. It was even a bigger response, and that's sort of how I got hooked on this stuff. Is that uh, I thought gosh, this touches the pulse of the public in a way that I had never been aware of before. I couldn't figure it out. So we thought maybe we would look into this. And in that third show, John Lear hinted that he might know a guy who was working out at Area 51 on recovered alien technology. You remember that show, John? Yeah, yeah. And you called me up uh, that afternoon and said, uh, any ideas on what we can do for an encore? And I said, well, I have a friend that just got canned out there. Maybe he would want to talk. And uh, then you set the whole thing up for that interview. So through Gene Huff, you meet Bob Lazar. And, yeah, um, Gene called me and uh, he said, um, uh, I'd like to get a copy of all your uh, your tapes and stuff. And I said, well, uh, uh, you know, I, I need an appraisal. <laughs> and so we traded the tapes for the appraisal. And he brought over Bob Lazar to hold the measuring tape. And uh, Gene and I are talking about, 
UFOs, and Bob couldn't have been more disinterested. He was rolling his eyes. I mean, he thought this was all just baloney. He just couldn't believe it. He said, look, I worked at Los Alamos. If, it had been, if there had been anything like that, I would have known. Well, first of all, you know, I had known Bob Lazar that long back then, so we we weren't as all buddy buddy as we we weren't as all buddy buddy as we are now. When I when I called John and said I'd like to get some of your copies of some of your stuff, the response was actually kind of get lost. I don't have time for that nonsense. And then he found out I was a real estate appraiser, and he did need a real estate appraisal, and then the deal took place. And I had brought Bob with me, and it was funny because I had never seen anybody treat Bob with such disdain as John. John did. John just thought he was some little kid that I brought, you know, with me to hold the other end of the measuring tape when we measured his house. <laughs> and about the third time that I said, you know, he used to work down at Los Alamos, John finally listened and said, you used to work at Los Alamos? And then the conversation started. <laughs> so the reason I, I raised the, these questions, I mean, the issues of how you guys all met is because there are critics out there who believe that John is somehow the evil puppet master who created this whole thing, who, uh, who talked Bob into making this story up, that you guys are all in this together. But the reality is you, you didn't really know each other, and it kind of fell into place. Well, and there's, there are giant personal things going on behind the scenes here. It wasn't, it wasn't all, you know, this easy and cut, cut and dried. It, there were a lot of coincidences that took place, um, you know, in Bob's personal life, things that went on that, you know, would just you know, not, not really be uh, fodder for this radio show. I mean, it, it sounds a lot more convenient than it was, but, yeah, it was – a lot of synchronicity, a lot of uh, sheer coincidence that made things turn out the way they did. I mean, the amazing part of it, uh, you know, Bob meet, Bob the photo guy meets Gene the appraiser. Gene the appraiser knows John Lear and offers to do an appraisal in, in exchange for this uh, UFO info. Bob is not the UFO guy, doesn't like the topic, doesn't think it's credible, and then suddenly gets hired out there. I mean, it is a lot to swallow that he, he, he was able to do it. Yeah, it was that three months between or four months between the summer of '88 and uh, in December when Bob got hired. Uh, you know, we gave him some pieces of information. Said, just look into this. And one of them was the uh, uh, the YY Dash Two facility, and the other was the Excalibur, and there was one more thing. And and this is really secret information. And so he talked to his friends back at Los Alamos. And they said, Yeah, yeah, there's such a place as that. Now. That doesn't mean that's where they keep the aliens, but there was a definitely a secret place. And so then he got interested, and that's when he called Dr. Teller and asked for the job out there. We'll come back to some. some excuse me, George, in case you hear some paper unfolding here, I'm unfolding a copy of Bob Lazar's personal daily calendar he kept on his wall from September of 88 through August of 89, so I'm ready with these dates and entries when we come back. Yeah, he's ready with December 6th trip to nowhere. <laughs> okay, well, I do want to get into that. I want to jump ahead, and we'll come back to this. I want to jump ahead to the trip out there into the desert 20 years ago tonight. You you both, I would assume, remember it pretty well. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, what? Tell me how that came about um, and uh, and what you saw when you got out there. John, why don't we start with you? Okay, well, uh, the day before, Tuesday, I was over at Bob's house, and he was making me uh, a doggy death ray. And what that was was my dogs <laughs> were getting in Marilee's flowers, and uh, we had to figure out a way to uh, keep them out. So he was making an amplifier that would broadcast a high-pitched sound, which would allegedly keep them out. And in the afternoon, he just said, uh, they're going to test fly a saucer tomorrow night. You want to go see it? And I said, well, how? And he said, well, there's a road on the northeast part of Groom Lake that leads in there, and without violating, uh, you know, their, uh, their, or trespassing, we can go right up to the border and watch it because it'll be coming right above S4. And I said, well, great, yeah, I'd love to do it. And that's how it started. And, Gene, uh, when did he tell you and ask you the same sort of question well, in the same way? You know, <sighs> That's the way it looked from John's viewpoint. Now, behind the scenes, what a lot of people didn't know was going on was, um, <clears throat> by the way, Mary Lee is John's wife. We got to watch talking so inside here, so the listening audience understands who's who when you right. say Mary Lee. <laughs> and uh, so uh, Bob's wife, then wife, they were divorced after this, had had an affair, and. Um, Bob was, even at that point, kind of distraught. He, Bob is a peculiar personality in that he loves women, 
and it's not a sexual thing. It's a it's Bob will do anything for women, and, and it, it could be he used to be in love with John's 80-year-old mother, Moya. He would do anything for her. Our four-year-old little girl, he'd teach her a t- science lesson. Now, Bob is adopted, and a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists and armchair therapists say that, you know, Bob's mom gave him away, and so therefore he spends his uh, life trying to, um, you know, appeal to women. I mean, I don't know if there's any substance to that. Certainly it's not anything to do with his mother. He, his mother, Phyllis, is as wonderful of a mother as any man could ever have, so it's not like he was lacking anything in his actual life. The people that adopted him are wonder, were a wonderful couple. And uh, But anyway, Bob's wife had had an affair, and he was actually taking her out there to impress her, to try and keep her and 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 we were excess baggage i mean i was happy to just be in on it and i'm sure john was too and you know i would have done anything to be included with that trip but i told john we spoke a little bit this afternoon that i don't think if bob hadn't been trying to impress his wife to keep her and you know do anything he could to attract her back to him i don't think any of us would have been taken out to see this but as long as he was taking his wife out there uh, we got to go too and i think he also wanted a couple of gregarious characters like john and i he knew he was going to blow the to blow the lid off this thing and he was going to need somebody to speak publicly to back him up if he got caught well it's an interesting point because you know a lot of people have asked in the years since why would bob violate his security oath why would he spill these beans uh, why would he risk going to prison by talking about this stuff or by taking you guys out there and showing you the tests and i guess you've just answered it is right. uh, he was trying to hang on to his wife yeah we weren't hanging around having a beer and he said hey you guys want to go see a flying sauce he's not that kind of guy in fact bob was you know while he was in this, I mean, he was a very peculiar personality. Here's a conversation with Bob. Oh, I'm exhausted. I'm dead tired. I was up to three in the morning last night. Oh, yeah, what, what were you doing? Why? <laughs> you know, as though you're prying into his life. You know, it's just a casual conversation. He would start a conversation, and you just ask a question any friend would, and then he'd act like you were prying into his personal life. But he was paranoid. The um, you know the people, Mike Bigpen. Uh, uh, well, that's a long story. Anyway, the the uh, who were they from? Uh, OFI. Yeah, Office the OFI. Of Federal Investigation. They were doing the security checks at his house in the middle of the night, and uh, a lot of big things going on that that uh, in Bob's personal life, and um, and so he had a lot of stress. He was in the in the, had the possibility of losing his wife. He was in the most secret and wonderful program that a, a scientist could ever dream of being in. He couldn't tell his wife. He couldn't tell his friends. And and uh, when he finally broke, uh, we were blessed because of it. So who goes out? How many of you went? Four? Just the four? Yeah. John That's and a- Bob and uh, Tracy, Bob's ex-wife, and me in John's RV the first night. You take oh. it from there, John. Yeah, okay. we left my house about, uh, I think it was about 7 o'clock, and we drive out there and um, uh, we're driving up that long uh, that long uh, hill there just before you get to the the pass and uh, and the transmission broke down and so uh, Gene agreed to uh, hike down to uh, Alamo there or to Rachel or to Alamo and get uh, some transmission fluid so we were delayed about an hour while he goes down and gets it we poured it in it works again we drive up we get to uh, uh, to the cutoff, the Groom Lake Road there, and drive down that long dirt road. So it's now it's about 8.15, 8.30, and we drive down this long, long road to about as far as we thought we could go without <clears throat> getting in trouble. And then we pull over. Uh, we get out. I had my 8-inch Celestron telescope, which I set up, and uh, Bob, you know, Bob said it's going to be at 9 o'clock. They test at 9 o'clock. So we all waited, and uh, I'm trying to focus in the uh, Celestron 8, which, uh, you know, is really tough to do. And uh, there it comes, right against the hill, just as advertised, at 9 o'clock. <clears throat> and this thing comes up and starts flying around. And, of course, it's very difficult to focus with the uh, Celestron 8, and I couldn't uh, get focused until it stopped uh, in midair and started descending. And that's when I said, I got it, I got it. And, you know, what I saw was a flying disc. It was oriented about 45 degrees to the horizon. It was throwing, radiating a, a yellowish, goldish kind of uh, stuff that was coming off it. And uh, <clears throat> I said, here, quick, Gene, take a look. <laughs> and as I, as I stepped back, I hooked my 
foot around the tripod and moved the uh, telescope. And, of course, Gene's never forgiven me. It was the most tragic, you know, trip in, ever in, in history, uh, uh, an extraterrestrial <laughs> disc in the middle of an 8-inch Celestron telescope in John's uh, foot hooked the tripod and, and uh, jarred it, and, and then the disc had gone down below the mountain range. But Could you see it with your naked eye? Well, we had binoculars out there, right. too. Well, yeah, and he's right about the glow coming off of it and everything that happened. You know, another peculiar thing was uh, this past Sunday, a week ago today, my son Daniel turned 20, and of course, which means that, and of course, which means that, you know, the, <laughs> the night this happened, I've got a seven-day-old baby, my first and only child, and my in-laws, my wife's parents are out here staying with us, and I'm pretty much a homeboy. I'm not one to up and go drinking with the boys in the middle of the week. So here on a Wednesday night, you know, after dark with a seven-year-old baby and my in-laws in town, I excuse myself and say I'm going out for the evening, which was pretty unusual. I didn't tell them where I was going or anything, but uh, I don't, nothing would have got me from joining, joining so, everyone on that trip. So Bob Lazar tells you when it's going to, uh, this test flight's going to take place. Sure enough, it turns out to be accurate. You see this thing. I mean, what a feeling that might have been, what must have been. What a rush. Right. Yeah, it really was. And, you know, I hear these stories occasionally. People say, you know, that uh, Bob, well, uh, he doesn't have a degree. We can't trace it down. So if he worked out there, he must have been a cook. Well, my answer to that is if he was a cook, then they tell all the cooks when the secret <laughs> test flights are going to be made on the flying saucers. Right. I mean, that's a big, it's a big point that he knew when the flights would take place because there exactly. had been no news stories about that. There had been no discussion about it in UFO circles or UFO magazines. He knew when they'd take place and whatever it was that was flying out there, it looked like a flying saucer, and he knew about it. So I don't know how you explain that one away. And we didn't mistake. You know, people go, oh, yeah, well, you probably mistook the stealth fighter or – or whatever. Well, you know, John Lear probably knows a little more about jets and airplanes than anybody you'll run into walking down the street. And we didn't mistake an airplane. I mean, you know, we're. I think the collective knowledge there was smart enough, though, that there was no fixed-wing aircraft that we were seeing. And in fact, we, Jim Taliani, another mutual friend of ours, was actually working on a Totopot test range then. He didn't have his clearance yet, but the, the uh, stealth fighters were still out at TTR then. So we, it, we didn't mistake a, a terrestrial craft for an ET craft. That mistake did not happen. How long was the thing in the air that you could see? I don't know. What would you say, John? Maybe 10, 15 minutes? Yeah, like less that? than that. Maybe six to eight minutes because I remember it was uh, right at 9 o'clock. And then we did that videotape that they played on TV the other night. And uh, and uh, uh, the, the video camera, I think it was like 9.05 or oh, okay. 9.06 or something that when we were, uh, you know, castigating each other you know there's a video camera ready to go and it's sitting on the bumper while we're watching you know <laughs> uh, the greatest thing in in history and nobody thought to pick it up but oh, it was, it was exhilarating God. though i mean it was it, it it was it's hard to believe it was us you you hear this story and uh it was just it was just unbelievable now at the time are you worried about getting caught it was bob worried about getting caught yeah, that, we were that, con- that first night we were concerned. That's the that's what some of us had the binoculars on the disc, and other had binoculars on the desert to see, keep an eye on the security guys to see if anybody would come out to chase us. Okay, so it was so much fun. Uh, he decides to uh, do it again, right? In the next two weeks, you went out again, same right. group, different, di- a couple slightly different group. Okay, now the the, the next time, the next Sunday or the next uh, Wednesday night was uh, March 29th, and that night I was uh, flying with. Uh, uh, American Trans Air, and I had a trip to Minneapolis. So on the Tuesday night, I called Bob, and I said, "What are you guys, are you guys going out? Or I said, what are you going to do? Uh, and he said, we're going fishing. And uh, so that was the, the secret code word, we're, we're going up to Groom Lake. In fact, well, on his calendar here, John, Wednesday the 29th, it says Jim, me, his wife, and it says fishing in parentheses underlined. That's what the entry is on Bob's calendar for that day. So you're and so that and so then uh, then the third night was uh, April sixth, and that was going to be the big night when we got you know we had the Geiger counters, the video cameras, the stuff and everything, and and there was me, Gene, Bob, uh, uh, Tracy's wife, and uh, and Tracy, and uh, that's that's the night we got caught. All right, we'll save that story for when we come back after the break, uh, how it uh, all went downhill, at least for Bob Lazar, and how the story eventually broke as a result. Uh, Stay with us, uh, our guests, uh, John Lear and Gene Huff, on Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp. Welcome back, everyone. 
Our guests, John Lear and Gene Huff, talking about the early days, the origins of the Area 51 story and Bob Lazar. Uh, let's go back, uh, John. You were talking before the break about this third trip that uh, that the George, group took up. Yes? I, I hate to interrupt, but I think we should step back to March 29th for a second. John okay. was out of town and didn't go. March 29th, we went out there again, and it was myself and uh, Bob's ex-wife, Tracy, Bob, and Jim Taliani, our mutual friend that worked out at Tonopah Test Range. And this was the night when the disc actually came the furthest, I guess, north up the mountain range, where we actually got the closest look. And, of course, after not getting any video of it that first night when John was there, we had a video camera, and Bob Lazar remembered to get some video, which is the famous video that's been shown on your specials of the disc jumping around in the sky. And this was when I told the story of how unusual it is to see a, a craft using gravity propulsion, which I speak matter-of-factly of now. I mean, I didn't know that's what I was seeing then. I was a, certainly a novice uh, speaking about any of this. But the, the craft would be a long way away, and uh, like like it was when we saw it the first time when John was there, the, the uh, amber, I guess, colored glow sort of coming off of it. And... and um, Unlike a train coming toward you on train tracks or a car on a highway, uh, the, the human brain is, uh, and eye is used to seeing objects move, and I guess we calculate geometrically the speed and, you know, where it's, whether it's going to intersect with us or that's how we anticipate something coming at us. I guess it's a, 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 a you know, a... a I guess similar to an animal, you know, when to when to flee, when to when to run, when to stand and fight, and and anyway, the uh, the disc would you'd be looking at it, and it wouldn't you wouldn't see it come toward you. You'd just blink, and suddenly it would be closer, and and you'd go now. Did, did that happen, or am I seeing things? And then you're still standing there looking at it, and then you'd blink, and suddenly it would be a lot closer. And this was alarming to your mind because you didn't see it travel at any particular speed toward you. It would just jump, and suddenly it would be nearer. And to the point where it came far enough down the uh, mountain range that it glowed very brightly, we actually backed up behind the trunk lid because it started to glow so brightly, I guess. I don't know if we thought it was going to explode or what. I mean, Bob didn't explain that that was just the glow from the from the you know electrical power dancing around on the uh, the static charge I guess on the skin of the disc. So we backed up and actually went behind the trunk lid. That's that's how uh, close it came and and how fearful we were of it. But that's that's the night Bob Lazar got the video and and that's the closest uh, we ever did see it come down the mountain range. Hey, okay, so after the first one and the second one, the trips out there where you saw these things, were you able to get any other information out of Bob or was he still being kind of closed mouth? Did you ask him, hey, you really do work out there? How did you know about this? What are those craft? And, and did he get into the propulsion technology, that sort of thing? Yeah. I mean, he would use the old demonstration of folding a dollar bill in half and showing how they distorted space and time to travel rather than flying in a straight line in a linear mode. But, uh, you, you know, he, he knew his phone was that. There were always noises on his phone. He had marital problems with his wife. I mean, he was very up and down emotionally. So, no, it wasn't a big party where you have a beer and go, now tell me about those flying saucers. It didn't happen. I mean, he let us in on that. and uh, But it wasn't a big UFO free-for-all uh, answering all the questions and telling us the secrets of the universe. I know that and, sounds strange, but that's the way it was. And I guess the personal question would be, did it work? Did it impress I mean, he's taken his wife out there to impress her and keep his marriage together. Did that part of it work? Was she impressed? Well, here's the answer. On April 10th, Bob's entry in his calendar says life equals zero. So I would say no. <laughs> John, it must have been driving you crazy to uh, have seen these things. Uh, I, I know uh, what an inquisitive mind you have. You must have had a million questions for him. Was Were you getting answers? Well, you know, the, the big night was uh, in December. The first time we went out there was December 6th. And I came home from a trip, I think a couple of days later, and I'm sitting at my desk, and he came over, and uh, I'm just writing out some checks, and uh, he just casually mentions, I saw a disc today. And I said, what? And he said, I saw a disc today. And I said, theirs or ours? He said, theirs. 
I said, well, what are you doing here? And I said, they've obviously followed you out here. They're going to find out you're telling me stuff. Why don't you work for a couple of months and then tell me? And, <laughs> and these are his exact words. He said, no, John. He said, you've taken so much crap over this for the past few months that I've known you. I wanted to tell you that it's real. I was there. I touched it. I was in it. And uh, it, it's real. And so then we spent about uh, two hours talking, and he would say, uh, he said, I can only answer questions. I can't volunteer information. Now, why he said that, I don't know, but that's exactly what he said. So, well, part of that, John, was the security guys had found out that, that Bob knew John Lear, and they wanted Bob to uh, interact with John to see if John really knew anything about the actuality of what was going on there. So while John was listening to Bob, Bob was listening to John <laughs> and reporting to the security guys what John said. So that's why Bob behaved Bob behaved like that as is, is he was spying on John. So and, whatever and, night that was in December, uh, you know, I, it was it was shocking to me because I remember we uh, we wrapped up the evening. He walked out. We stood at the front door. We looked up at a star, and I said, now, if I wanted to go there, I said, uh, and I had a craft, do I just head towards it? He said, no, you go to the right. And uh, so then I, he explained how that happened or how that worked. And I remember walking in, inside and, and uh, standing in my den and just standing there for about 10 minutes, just totally, totally awestruck at the information that I had been told that night because, of course, you know, I, be I believed it. You know, the stuff that I knew, I thought it was true. But for somebody to say, yes, I saw it, it's true, you know, the whole thing is true, I mean, that was, that was really something. That really, it took about, you know, several months uh, uh, for it to sink in, for you to real, really believe that, yes, yes, it's true. There are aliens. Uh, they are visiting us. And, and Bob did work on their craft. So, so there's John, you, you can authenticate that after he started telling us things, it still wasn't a free-for-all where he'd just answer questions and write. I mean, he'd still be closed-mouthed about things. Uh, I, I, I sensed a type of paranoia, I guess. He, he had people, you know, doing random security checks at his house, but it was never until much later just a big party where he'd just entertain and answer every question he could about the craft, Right. Right. Yeah, you know, one, we were, one I'm sorry, go ahead, phone, John. Go ahead. Go ahead, John, I'm sorry. One thing about the phone taps is uh, my phone was tapped, too, and I had a guy uh, from, uh, it was Centel then, and uh, I had a couple of teenage daughters. By the way, uh, 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 Jackie and uh, Allie and Moy and Jill are listening tonight. Hello to Good. them. Uh, Allie and uh, Jax had uh, telephones and were always changing their numbers and always changing rooms and everything. And so uh, we knew the Centel guy. So one day he's out here, and this is like in December, January, when all this is going on. And he comes down to my den after, you know, working on a project. He says, John, your phone's tapped. And I said, yeah, well, I'm not surprised. He says, well, do you mind if I uh, check and see where the tap is? I said, no, you know, uh, if it doesn't cost anything, no, it doesn't. He, so he came back in about a half an hour, and he said, you know, I've been down Monroe and down Hollywood and down Bonanza, and the tap is further than that. And I said, well, don't worry about it. I said, all our phones are tapped. You know, we're into this flying saucer stuff. He says, no, I just want to check. So the next morning, he shows up about 10 o'clock. Uh, he says, John, I can't work on your phones anymore. I said, why not? He's because, he said, I traced your tap, and it's a mainframe, and there is no paperwork for it, and I took it to my boss, told her about it, and she said, uh, if you don't like it, you can quit. Wow. And uh, so that was the that was a pretty interesting time. Yeah, we should was. also point out that there was another tap uh, that became relevant to Bob's life. In fact, that's how he found out that his wife was having an affair. And we'll get into that story and then go back to the uh, the big confrontation with the security guys when we come back. I'm George Knapp. This is Coast to Coast. Stay with us. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. I'm George Knapp, joined by Gene Huff and John Lear, talking about the early days of the Area 51 story, the legend. Uh, Gene um, you'd mentioned earlier, and we don't want to get too much into Bob's personal life, uh, but it is relevant to the larger story that uh, that he learned that his wife had been having an affair, and I think it was with her flight instructor at the time. Tell us how he learned that. Well, uh, by the way, I wanted to interject here while John and I say uh, Bob told us this and Bob took us out there and showed us that, and it's important for someone listening to understand the the emotional uproar in Bob's life. I mean, here's a guy who is going to work on call. He's not even on a, on a steady schedule yet. And when he's at work, 
you know, he's done everything from read reports on, you know, an alien civilization and seen alien bodies vivisectioned and weighed and and ultimately actually, you know, went inside and touched a a flying disc that, you know, as far as he could tell and as far as was told to him, was brought here from another star system along with seeing another eight beside the one that he touched and was in. Uh, in addition to having, uh, you know, being in the process of losing the love of his life, uh, you know, this guy was an emotional mess when this was going on. So not everything makes sense and probably sounds as perfect as it could or should have been. But, you know, it, it was a bad time in, in Bob's life when this was going on. Now, how how he... Uh, you want to know how he found out she was having an affair? Yeah, John and you were both talking about uh, security measures. John mentioned that his phone, he believed, was tapped. And, uh, yeah, and... well, you know, ultimately, uh, the the guys at the OPM, at the, uh, what were we going to call them? The uh, OFI, the, Office the, of the Federal OFI, yeah, who works for the OPM, Office of, Office of Personnel Management. The OFI had his phone tapped, and they had heard his wife having conversations with her boyfriend over the phone. Uh, they didn't know whether Bob knew or not, so they were, they already knew that they were going to, that if Bob lost his wife, he would be in emotional turmoil and be a security risk, so they were going to at least temporarily yank his clearance, but they couldn't do that until they knew that he knew that his wife was having an affair. They knew before he did. And so ultimately she confessed and told him she was having an affair. And uh, if I remember correctly, she called her mother over the phone, uh, I think, or maybe it was her father, in another state, and said, you know, I'm, I'm messed up in the head. I'm emotional, in emotional turmoil. I've been having an affair. And I told Bob, and when the guys at the... Uh, 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 on the so, other end, at the OFI, heard now they knew Bob knew his wife was having an affair, and coincidentally, this all all happened on the day or the day before Bob took us out for the last uh, to witness the last disc test. So all of this came down when uh, I guess we should go into how we got caught out in Central Nevada. Yeah, let's get, tell that story. Go ahead, John. You take over. Okay, so it was uh, Tracy and her and her sister and Bob and me and Jean. We get in the car, uh, we start down the road and uh, towards uh, the lake bed. And uh, the question was, how far do we go? And, and I kept saying, I was riding shotgun. I kept saying, well, let's stop here because you know even a mile closer isn't going to help us, uh, you know, get any clearer shots. So uh, they decided, well, let's go a little bit further. Went further and further, and all of a sudden, two sets of headlights come on in front of us, and, they, and just right at the same time. And so we thought, well, there could be a problem here. So I told um, Tracy's sister, I said she was driving. I said, now careful when you turn around because we don't want to get stuck in the dirt here. So we turn around and we go racing down this dirt road. Now our lights are off, also, John. They <laughs> don't want her to hit the brake lights because they'll see our brake lights. Go ahead. <laughs> So we go racing down this road, and uh, it's obviously they're going to catch us. So we decide, and this is before we got to the highway, <clears throat> we decide, well, let's pull over. We'll jump out. I'll set up the telescope. And if they ask us what we're doing, we'll just say we're looking at the stars. And uh, so Now, John, just to interject here, prior to that, we stopped, and when we knew we were going to get caught, Bob got out of the car took the gun, and just in case of rattlesnakes, and went running across the desert toward the highway so he wouldn't get caught with us. Now, go go ahead. Okay, yeah, but that, that was the last stop. So we right. jump out. I get the, uh, the telescope out. <clears throat> I start setting it up. Bob runs out in the desert with a gun, and we're all standing around there, and then the two cars show up, skid into a stop, and the, uh, and the security guys get out, and they've got the guns. And uh, they were big so, guys too. Are, are are they pointing guns at you? No, they're on their shoulder. They're okay. on their shoulder. So before they got out, uh, I uh, I ran up to the car and I, I uh, to their car and I put my hands on the on the top of the car and I said, uh, "You guys aren't dopers, are you? Yeah, we thought you were chasing <laughs> us, you know." And they said, "No, we're not dopers. Uh, we'd like to ask you a few questions." So. They ask us for uh, they ask us what we're doing out there, and we say we're looking at the stars. And then they said, well, then why were you driving so fast 
away from us. And, of course, nobody had an answer for that. So they said, okay, well, let, we need to uh, to see some uh, driver's licenses and Social Security numbers. So we gave them our Social Security numbers, and I guess we were there. My Wait, John, is that is that true? Because I thought I – thought, um... I thought it was you. I, I didn't think we presented ID to them. We presented ID to the sheriff later. That's right. That's right. But we told them our Social Security numbers then. Right, right. So um, uh, we gave them our Social Security numbers. I guess it was about a half an hour. They came back and they said, okay, now look, we can't kick you off this land because it belongs to BLM, but we can give you an awful lot of problem if you stay here. And uh, so they jump in their car and... We thought they drove away. They said, we'd like to have you up on the highway. If you're looking at stars, the stars will look just as good from up there. <laughs> so the, uh, the the trunk is open uh, because I had gotten the telescope out, and it's, and it's bright. So we can't see too much except what's in the, in, right around the car. So anyway, we wait for about 10, 15 minutes, and here Bob comes out of the desert. And... Uh, so he tells us this, this fantastic story. He says, "Boy, I had my, I had the nine millimeter pointed right at him. If they were going to come at me, I was going to blow them away. Me, I was going to blow them away. Da 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 da." So unbeknownst to us, the security had parked about a hundred meters down the road, turned turned off uh, their car, and they were recording us. They were taking video, and they had this parabolic mic, and they were recording what we were saying. Well, also, John, remember. I guess they were watching us through night vision goggles, and, and, you, and I, you and I saw a green glowing thing kind of drop as though somebody had them at their eyes and dropped them down hanging around their neck, and we saw this green light. And I said, did you see that? And you were the one that said, yeah, they're, those must be night vision goggles. So they were watching us also. Yeah, but yeah, I guess I didn't put it together that it was them that had the night vision goggles. <laughs> but anyway... So Bob tells his story, and we're laughing and joking and telling about flying saucers and everything and not realizing that we were being recorded. So we uh, break down the telescope, put it in the back of the car, and uh, and uh, shut the trunk. And now, in the trunk also, we've got a Geiger counter, a telescope, video cameras, gun. We were really equipped that night to, right. for everything. Go ahead. So we drive up, and just as we hit the highway, um, what is it, Lincoln County? Lincoln County or Nye County, Sheriff? Sure. Lincoln. It's Lincoln. Yeah. What is it? Lincoln. Yeah. Lincoln, Lincoln County. Lincoln County Sheriff uh, puts on the lights, the siren, and everything. And uh, Officer La Moreau. Yeah. What was his first name? Doug. Doug. Was yeah. yeah. Doug. Doug. Doug La Moreau. Yeah. I got a good story about him. Anyway, uh, so over the loudspeaker says, uh, "Get out of the car. Put your hands on top of the, you know, on top of the car." And you know, we're all doing that anyway. But he keeps saying it louder. And you know, we're thinking, "All right, all right, we're doing it." You know, I said, "Get out of the car." Put your hands on top of the car. So we're all standing there, five of us with our hands on top of the car. And uh, so he says, okay, well, now I've only got two questions here. Is, uh, number one, why are there five people in the car here and there was only four when you were on the test site? And where's the gun? <laughs> so it was really funny because we were there for about an hour. And, uh, and uh, he never did recover the gun. Well, we didn't give him permission to search the truck. <laughs> and he kept us there as long as he legally could without taking us in. He said, "I, you know, I could, I, you know, I'd have to take you in if I'm going to detain you any longer. But you know, just stay away from here and no more shenanigans." And then he let us go. So Gene's kidding me here is because uh, the, the uh, Doug Lamoureau, the sheriff, uh, says, uh, "Okay, I need to see some driver's license." And like a complete idiot, and I and I admit it, I was a complete idiot. I said, "My driver's license is in my jacket in the trunk." <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, neither we Bob or Gene will ever forgive me for that. But um, so I guess we uh, – I said, oh, no, no, it's not in the trunk. And Doug says, open the trunk. Oh, boy. So we opened the trunk, but he didn't search it. He just uh, – Took a peek. I got out my license. And uh, that was the, probably one of the weirdest hours in my life is we're all sitting – we're all standing in front of the car in front of Doug, Doug Lamoureux. He's got, got those two questions. He says, look, he says, no problem. I get a, I can get a search warrant. He says, uh, either you, uh, you know, tell me what I need to know or, uh, or you know, we're going to take you in. So it was really interesting. We sat and shuffled there, and, and, and nobody made any comment. And then after about an hour, Doug says, okay, I don't know what the deal is here. 
and I don't know why I'm being told this, but I'm told to let you go. So. Okay, I'll tell you what, we're going to stop the story there, pick it up after the break. Or we're going into the break uh, talking with Gene Huff and John Lear about Area 51, and this is uh, Leonard Skidder I Know a Little. We're talking with Gene Huff and John Lear about the beginnings, the origins of the Area 51 story. They're regaling us with the, the night that they got caught out there after Bob Lazar had taken them out to show them uh, a third uh, disc flight. And uh, that was pretty much the beginning of the end for Bob Lazar and his involvement with that program. He was in a lot of trouble, uh, but it was not the end of the story. When we come back, we'll pick up what happened next. Stay with us on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back, everyone. Gene Huff, John Lear, talking about Area 51. Let's uh, pick up the story, fellas, uh, where you, you've just got caught the uh, by the security guys and then by the sheriff. They take down this information uh, how quickly does that filter back to Bob's employers? George, I think we should first interject also. That night, the third night, we had rented a car. That's why they couldn't run plates and get any ID or info on any of us because we had to rent a car. So that, that kind of uh, baffled La Morale also. That's why you couldn't find out who we were without our IDs. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, had, well, let me put it this way. Had there been a disc flight while all this is going on, obviously you're not paying much attention to what's going on <laughs> over the hills, but did they have a test flight that night, or did you see it? I don't remember seeing one. I don't think we saw anything that night. Okay, so how quickly do things go downhill for Bob as a result of what happened out there? Well, on, on his calendar here, it says, <laughs> they call but he called that night bad day at groom, and the next day it says debriefed at work. So the very next day he went in, he was called in to go to work, and uh, he went to the EG&G terminal, which no longer exists. That, that, if you remember, you guys do because you're in Las Vegas, the EGG G and G terminal at that point in time abutted Sunset Road, not far east of the Las Vegas Strip, and he went there. And uh, Dennis Mariani, who was the security guy that shadowed him when he was at S four, uh, said that uh, Bob started to go toward the plane to take the to take the jet out to land at Area fifty one. And Dennis said we won't be going that way tonight. And they took uh, they took a car and uh, actually drove out to Indian Springs Air Force Base where uh, Bob got a very nasty debriefing. And uh, they they showed him, uh, they asked him why he took all of his friends and family out there to watch the disc as he said, that's kind of what we, what, what we meant when we told you this was above top secret, you know, that we want, didn't want you to tell everybody about it. And, <laughs> and uh, they showed him a stack of transcripts of everything on his phone lines, including his wife, Tracy, talking with her boyfriend and uh, said that now that he knew his pretty little wife was having an affair, he was a security risk and uh, that they were going to yank his security clearance uh, I had, for some period of time. I don't remember the duration, but he could reapply you know, months or whenever down the road uh, when he'd be more emotionally stable. Well, isn't that astonishing that they would say that he could come back to the program after he has obviously, you know, spilled the beans to people well, without clearances? You know, that is a good question, and we've, we've I've discussed that with Bob, and we really concluded that probably the decision on what to do with him was done at a higher level. They they had to do something immediately, right? They got a guy from the program taking people out there to watch the disc test. They've got to reprimand him and kick him out. But what to do with him for the long term had to come from wherever, Washington, D.C., wherever, whoever, you know, whoever calls the shots, whoever that may be or they may be, uh, may not have known you know, by that next day, I think uh, they had to decide what to do. This was just, this was the interim reprimand. And in fact, it, it, it definitely it was because they had called him and told him that they wanted to come back out to work. And he, and he said, no, I'm not going. And they said, are you refusing? He said, yeah, I'm not coming out there anymore. So they did call to have further intercourse with Bob Lazar, but he wouldn't go back out. Yeah, he was worried what might happen to him right, out there. Right, right. Now, one of John. the interesting things they told them uh, in the debriefing is when they started it, they said, uh, oh, yeah, when you talked uh, to John Lear and said you were going fishing, that really threw us for a <laughs> Yeah, that really fooled us. <laughs> fishing John, you, like, but you know, show, go ahead. To show the roller coaster that this guy's life was on. Now, he's losing his wife. Now, here in on a day in April, you know, on his cal daily calendar, he writes, 
His life was so mundane that here at the beginning of April, he wrote the entry, we turned house air conditioner on and car air conditioner on. He actually recorded what day he turned his home and car air conditioning on. The next day it says bad day at groom, and the next day it says debriefed at work. So he goes from having so little going on that he's writing he turned his air conditioner on to going to see show us a disc desk at groom to getting debriefed at Indian Springs Air Force Base. And that's the, that's the roller coaster this guy was on at that point in time. John, you know uh, all the criticisms of the story that have surfaced over the years, and people, I, understandably, there are problems with it. There are gaps. There are things that don't seem to make sense. Part of the the, the one that really uh, sticks in people's craw is, is how Bob could be out there um, without a clearance, uh, you know, in a short period of time. Con- when you consider all the strange things in his life, um, uh, you know, the questions about his educational credentials, things of that sort, the fact that he knows you, and then he brings people out to see this test flight, and they still are talking to him about working for him. That uh, that a lot of people have trouble buying all that. I'd have trouble buying it if it didn't happen to me. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, but George, you know, this brings up a good point, and, and and a lot of scientists, in fact, that email you have trouble with this because they all say, "Look, I've got a PhD. I'm one of the foremost scientists in that field," and. Certainly, they would have chosen me before Bob Lazar, and of course, your credentials weren't necessarily the cri- credentials weren't necessarily the criteria. I mean, Bob's adopted, Bob's a renegade. Uh, you know, I, 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 who am I to say what the criteria is? But they have to decide who will be helpful, who can take it. I mean, let's face it, there are there are philosophical, uh, theological ramifications to all of this. And uh, they don't just let – it wasn't a, a contest of who has the greatest credentials, that's who gets in this program. And this offends some people. You know, certainly if, if they would have wanted great scientists, well, they would have chosen me. So, therefore, I don't believe this is going on. But the criteria was, wouldn't you say, John, was never who had the greatest credentials. Yeah, it was who they could probably discredit the easiest if he ever said anything about it. And And the fact that Bob had a – uh, 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 a chance meeting with Edward Teller, and that you know, just a word from Doctor, the late Doctor Edward Teller, uh, probably meant a lot. I mean, it, I, I, you know, who knows how all of that happened? But uh, it, uh, you know, Bob did. You know, we still don't know the the totality other than what Bob told us of what he did uh, down at the Maison Physics Facility down at Los Alamos. I mean, he did have a background. Uh, uh, you, people have told John. You have other CIA guys have told you that they they love to take adopted people and orphans and people that they can, uh, you know, get rid of and get get rid of their personal information and have no family looking for them. Right, right? just so they can shoot them and nobody will say, "Hey, what happened to my uh, dad?" and stuff like that. And the idea of uh, that, that that they would take somebody with gaps in their background, John, and you mentioned it. And maybe he was the mo- one of the most qualified guys in the country. If you were looking for someone with scientific and technical ca- capabilities and expertise, but who could just be easily um, destroyed if the if the need arose. Right. Uh, he told us about he had three interviews uh, after he called Doctor Teller. Then he was uh, called in, and the first uh, interview. Uh, They were all, I guess, technical interviews. Uh, And he told us after he did those interviews, each one, he said, uh, he said, I aced it. And he told us exactly what they asked and what his answers were. And they were of a highly technical nature. The only interesting thing was on the second interview, the first question was, now tell us about John Lear and uh, what your relationship is with John Lear. And uh, he says, uh, I know John Lear. Uh, but I think uh, he sticks his nose in places where it doesn't belong. Right. And Bob said uh, what he didn't tell him is he also likes to stick his nose into places it doesn't belong. <laughs> you know, here's a funny thing. Remember I told you that Bob uh, loves to uh, appease women. And uh, while he was still, <laughs> John, you aren't going to like me saying this, when uh, when he was still trying to do whatever he could to impress his wife to keep her and attract her back, here's an entry here that uh, they took a flight when John was, he was ferrying an L-1011, so Bob's wife was taking flying lessons. Now, she doesn't even have a private pilot's license. John lets her fly an L-1011 in the, in the pilot's chair, and what did you give her, 20 or 30 minutes of flight time? John in, in that L-1011? 
hello, hello, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's another attempt to trying to get his woman back. Someone you, named John let him fly in L ten eleven. Maybe it wasn't John later. Yeah, there's plenty of guys named John in this world. <laughs> You know, you've both both have heard the criticism that maybe maybe this was a setup that uh, that they were they had got Bob for this job just precisely so they could do exactly that. They figured he's kind of a rebel and a, a troublemaker, and there's no way he's going to be able to keep this secret. We'll tell him some stuff. He'll go ahead and spill the beans, and we'll all have a good laugh about it. What do you think about that? Starting with you, John. Certainly plausible. I've always thought that, or, you know, I thought uh, possibly that they were trying to get the information out. And they said, Lear's interested in this. Let's work this out so, you know, he can get the information out. And uh, and I've always told Bob, we you know, we tried our best, but we didn't do a very good job. But when you extrapolate that out, that there must have been some people who wanted to get it out and some who didn't, right? Yeah, I, I think there was a conflict there because if they all wanted to, if it was a consensus that they wanted to get it out, you know, it, they, they, it could have been accomplished. Uh, they, you know what I mean? They try, certainly tried to, pre, pre, to prevent it after the fact. Well, the effect was they, they put it out and they drew it back. I mean, you know, you allowed Bob to, to spill those beans, allowed us to tell the stories, and then, uh, in the eyes of a lot of people, discredited him entirely. But they told him when he was there, he asked them, how do you keep this secret? And they said it's the easiest thing in the world to keep secret, that as long as you don't prove anything one way or the other, as long as you keep people on the fence and you know ridicule those who believe or who think they've seen proof, ridicule them and, and just uh, dismiss the rest, uh, it's an easy thing to keep secret because everybody wants to say, oh, there's, there's no life anywhere else that we've discovered. You know, why would we have the SETI project? Why, you know, but, and, and as a counterpoint, George, look at all the information you've amassed from civilian pilots, military pilots, I mean, uh, confirmed with rate, ground radar, air radar, uh, an actual sighting by pilots. It's something moving thousands of miles an hour past an airliner. And a long time ago, before it could possibly be any terrestrial aircraft, in the 50s, you know, a crew of Air Force men. And yet everybody goes, well, I wonder what that was. You know, they don't, even though it couldn't possibly have been a craft from Earth piloted by human beings, they still don't conclude that that must be something or someone from somewhere else. So, Or our government saying, well, gosh, this, is, this can't be a threat to national security, so we're not going to worry about it. I mean, craft that can outfly anything you've got that demonstrate mastery over things like nuclear missiles and and uh, can can even enter nuclear codes on your most powerful weapon systems. I mean, it's... To, if that is not national security stuff, I don't know what is. Right. And there is no one there, you know, from from the biggest skeptic, I mean, if everyone was intelligent and honest, if anyone, people who, who dismissed the possibility that there's life elsewhere and that that life has been here, that it is here or that it has been here, uh, you know, in antiquity, uh, if they actually read and examined the evidence, they could do nothing but conclude that there is life somewhere else and that life has visited the earth. But it's easier to not examine it and just say, well, why don't they land on the White House lawn? And since they haven't, I don't believe it. What about the idea that they uh, they allowed this story to be told, used Bob to tell it, used the rest of us to tell it, so that they could uh, distract attention from something else, maybe something else that was uh, a legitimate, uh, earthly-made technology out there? What do you think about that, John? Very plausible. Yeah, they uh, they had a lot of things to cover up. <clears throat> I think the um, they kind of mastered the cover up there with the F one seventeen because uh, the F nineteen uh, uh, was a secret. It still is a secret. We haven't heard of any brand new, really super sophisticated airplanes except the F twenty two, and that's that's old technology. And certainly, you know, after uh, twenty twenty five years, they have stuff that's uh, that's really really uh, out of this world as far as technology. And and to that end, whatever that end was, they'd have alien beings visit the section. I'm not saying I'm naive, and I, I know what great lengths they could go to program someone. But I always say to what end. I mean, they go, you know, is that the best thing they could come up with? We, we're afraid that someone's going to see our new spy plane. So I'll tell you what, let's try and uh, make everyone think that, you know, flying saucers and there's light. You know, that's a pretty touchy subject. I mean, it touches theology and philosophy that there must be a better way is what I'm thinking. 
Well, my thought is if that really was the plan, that they had a, an idea that let's tell this crazy UFO story, then destroy destroy the credibility of the story and we'll distract attention away from whatever is flying around out there, whatever secret projects we've got going at this very, very valuable base, that, that policy was a miserable failure and backfired on them because to this day, you've still got people going out there with binoculars and telescopes to see whatever it is that's flying around in the sky. You've had tens of thousands of people who've made the trek out into the desert. You've had every major news organization in the world gone out there to look around. You've had congressional investigators and all kinds of media attention. If they didn't want attention for something that was going on out there, uh, somebody really screwed up. <laughs> Not only there, but everywhere. There's nowhere in the world that people aren't looking you know as a as a reaction to that probably and and so you can you just because you can't get away with it there you probably can't get it get away with any anywhere that there are human beings the idea that uh, some people have raised that bob was part of this thing that he was a, a disinformation agent working with this government john how would you respond to that that he was a different disinformation yeah, agent yeah that he was working with them to tell this story and and stir the pot uh, it's certainly plausible i don't believe it but you know he could have been you know the I've heard that before, and first of all, I've even heard Bob say, you know, had they asked me to do that, I probably would have participated. He doesn't deny that he would be a guy that would do that if they asked him. However, he is the worst guy in the world. Bob, Bob can't, you know, his memory. He can't keep. He he treats most subjects with such disdain. He wouldn't waste his time. Waste his time. Uh, and Bob told that same story, uh, uh, you know, he would be the worst guy in the world to make up a lie and trying to perpetuate a lie. He just, he, he's too busy being productive, doing other things. I mean, it, he would, he would be the worst guy to include that type of endeavor. Uh, one of the threads that's out now, and we're going to cover some, some ground um, uh, that where the, the controversy still uh, rages over whether he's a legit guy or not, whether there really was a program like this out there. Uh, something I saw on Above Top Secret, a thread, uh, just saw it yesterday, talking about Papoose Lake. And these guys theorize that since they cannot see any roads on the, their Google shots of Papoose Lake leading from Groom down to Papoose. Therefore, there was never a facility there. You want to tackle that one, John? Yeah. Um, Google is, uh, uh, is monitored by the Department of Defense, and every sensitive uh, area is airbrushed. And if you don't believe that, just go to <clears throat> the uh, Nevada test site. There's a huge new uh, facility called Sandia. Uh, there's two huge new runways. It's about a third of the way from Tonopah Test Range to Groom Lake. Many of my friends have been there. Many of the people work there, and there's nothing visible on uh, on Google. Go to Wake Island or Johnston Island or Midway Island, where the military has a huge presence now, and all there is is just uh, <clears throat> you know just um, um, plain sand and stuff. And there's huge operations out there. And uh, so all of this stuff uh, where you – anybody that thinks they're using Google and can find out any information, all of that – all the good stuff is airbrushed out. Well, I remember seeing uh, satellite photos where you could see roads out there. In fact, I've got one hanging on my wall right now. Um, so – and that, and that's – I'm pretty sure that uh, guys who have worked at Area 51 who've come forward, who've talked about – and they, they don't buy the saucer story – but they said that there were uh, other kinds of test uh, flights out at Papoose that they've used it for a number of years. Yeah, in 1990, they moved uh, the real sensitive stuff up north, just south of Wendover. And uh, as, yeah, you got those maps I sent you? Yeah. So you, you think that they, uh, as a result of this story breaking, that they moved all the sensitive stuff somewhere well, else? I think it was already being built at that time. But they did move it all up there. It's out the Wendover, or just to the east of Highway uh, 93 Alternate. And I have friends that uh, work there, and uh, it's it's really a huge facility, and it's very very secret. It's the new Area 51, but you know it's 20 years old now. And so George, you, I I think it's naive. I mean, what year was it? You won the Emmy Award for UFOs: The Best Evidence, a two-hour UFO special. I don't know if people elsewhere would know. People in Las Vegas that were around then would know that. And by that next year, they were taking tour buses out to Central Nevada, so it. It would be naive to think that they kept doing disc tests on Wednesday night after dark, after 
you know, essentially the entire world was informed of it. Uh, they, they, that program was definitely moved. This is what's funny about. Well, I tell you what, hold that, hold that thought, uh, because when we come back, we'll get into discussing how uh, Area 51 story went across the world like a tsunami. Stay with us for a conversation with Gene Huff and John Lear. Beatles, take us into the break. Welcome back, everyone. We're talking about the Area 51 story, and I know the broad strokes of this story are well known to many of our listeners uh, who are wondering why we're covering this, this the same stuff. And, and what I had hoped with this conversation with Gene Huff and John Lear is that we fill in some of the blanks, and that is the small stuff that happened. The broad strokes are well known. The story has gone all over the world, of course. It's the small stuff, uh, the details about uh, – the trips out there to see the saucers that I think are important, important in the chain of evidence about the, the story. Uh, you know, the point being, how did Bob know? You know, if he's a fraud, as many people uh, believe, and, and they have some reasons to believe that, how did he know the test flights would take place on Wednesday nights? Uh, because the witnesses, uh, two of whom we're talking to tonight, went out there, they videotaped it, they saw it, it really did happen. How did he know? Uh, there are many questions that have been raised about his academic credentials, and we'll get into some of that as well. But it's the small stuff and what, what uh, the people who were directly involved with Bob lived through that I think is very telling. And, and every day I get inquiries about uh, the Area 51 story, and I'm sure you guys do too, from a, a, new, uh, a whole new round of uh, – uh, folks out there who've just discovered the Area 51 story and, and uh, are curious about it, which is you know, part of the reason we're covering this. Uh, what I'd like to go into for the next couple of minutes is what it what it um, was like during that time period, because it was a tumultuous time. A lot of things were going on. You guys lived through it. I lived, I lived through some of it. And it was uh, there were some strange things that really were happening, which uh, the people who don't believe the story and don't want to accept it have hard times uh, ac accepting. Gene, why don't you uh, start it off? I mean, you were really close to Bob. You lived through it. You know what happened in the months and years afterward. Why don't you just give me a, a, a general sense of what it was like then? Well, after, you know, uh, after he went on television and said, did we get that far yet, I guess? No, we haven't got that far. <laughs> I just see where we're at here. Well, first of all, he was destroyed. Eventually, Tracy left, and uh, Bob was a broken man. I mean, borderline suicidal. Uh, uh, he was just literally physically sick, and uh, he was destroyed emotionally. So now look what he's gone through. He's gone from, you know, being in between scientific jobs, working at Los Alamos, running a little uh, – uh, photo processing lab out of his home amongst the many other projects. I mean, he's, Bob's a productive guy. He's always doing something with, with science and technology, jet cars, uh, things like that. And he goes and gets into this program, gets exposed to alien hardware, gets caught, gets kicked out of the program, loses his wife. I mean, he was a broken man. I mean, he really felt he had nothing left to live for at that point in time. Yet the heat was still on when they called him and demanded that he report back uh, out to work, and he told them no. Well, now he not only were there clicks on all of our phone lines, uh, he, he started being followed. One time he went to work out at a gym, um, with uh, Shelley Ball, uh, who is Jim Taliani's significant other, the guy that we mentioned before worked out at uh, Tonopah Test Range. And he had, and Bob owned an Uzi, uh, you know, and not full automatic, but semi automatic Uzi. And they went in and worked out at the gym. When they come out, the doors to Bob's car are standing wide open, and it had been, they'd rifled through the papers in there, yet the Uzi is still sitting there on the floor. So if it was just some punks who broke into his car, they certainly would have stolen that Uzi. Instead, his car is just left with the doors standing wide open, his gun still in there. Things like that happened. I'd, I'd be at my appraisal office. Uh, we were all not carrying guns, that would have been illegal, but there were guns at the place, <laughs> the buildings we were at at that point in time, and Bob would stop by on his photo route. I'd be sitting there doing real estate appraisal. He'd come in uh, with his face all red and say, give me, your, give me your gun, and I'd hand him a gun, and he'd go back out in his car. There'd be people chasing him around. Uh, uh, when he was getting on Highway 50, 15 one time, a government-looking vehicle with blacked-out windows pulled up next to him and was chasing him, and they pulled up next to him. The window rode down, and they shot his tire out. 
that's the night he stayed over at my uh, at my place, slept on the couch because right. he was scared to go home. Right, he didn't want to go back to his house, and uh, he came home the one night, and his entire house had been rifled through. The door, front door, had been broken open. The deadbolt had been broken open, and people had looked through his house and left the door ajar and everything messed up. So, not only were they after after him, they wanted him to be paranoid. They wanted him to know that they were listening to his phone and that they were following him. So, it didn't was, they write something on his blackboard or something like that, or or erase something, or? Yeah, that- yeah, I think I think so. I don't remember specifically what it was, but there were a whole host of of paranoid situations that Bob was going through, and and he was in he was in no shape. Uh, you know, he was out there on the edge anyway. It, it was a bad time in his life. And John, you remember uh, this time period? Uh, you know, people who weren't there, uh, didn't live through it, have a hard time accepting that it was real. But it was real uh, for those who were living it. Yeah, it was real, and uh, it, you know when you when you come to the realization that yes, there are aliens, they are visiting. We the government does interact with them. We do have access to their technology. I mean, it's a real. It's something that uh, it takes you a few months to get used to. And you know, there were other things that we didn't cover here, George. Like when Bob was in the program, he was told that there were. Uh, one guy that worked uh, as one of the scientists out at S4 didn't show up for work for a night or two, and they were uh, on the lookout for him, and I guess they sent guys from the OFI to try and find him, and the word was that the Russians were in Las Vegas trying to bribe people for information of what was going on at S4, and at this point in time, Dennis Mariani, who was, again, the the security guy who shadowed Bob to and from work, uh, took Bob to the police substation over on St. Louis, down by St. Louis and Eastern Avenue, and registered his gun. Bob had moved here from New Mexico, and he had that Uzi, and he had a 44 Magnum, and a another, he had a 44 Magnum, and a, another small pistol, like a 25 or whatever, and uh, and they went, here's, here's vintage Bob Lazar. Out of the EG&G building, they were going to issue him a gun. And uh, it was just a little 32 or whatever. And the lady told Bob that he had to sign for it and that if it came up missing, he was going to owe them $500. And the, Bob argues with them and said it doesn't even cost that much. Why would I give you $500 if I lost a gun that only cost $250? And uh, he said, why can't I use my own gun? And she said, well, we didn't know you had any. And that's because he lived in New Mexico and you didn't have to register guns back then. And they took him to the police substation. But, but it's funny that here Bob Lazar is in the most secret program anyone could ever imagine. The Russians are chasing people around. They go to issue him a gun, and he argues about the deposit on it. And uh, but anyway, so Dennis Mariani took him down to the police substation and registered his guns, so he would have legally registered guns to protect himself. And of course, since then, I think the head guy at that substation was lieutenant. And of course, George, we have a mutual acquaintance, TJ, who I've tried to get people to go down and you know that would be important to get those records. Who who did Dennis Mariani? talk to that they could just walk in there in the evening at nighttime and register a gun at a police substation like that. But, uh, you know, people who tried to get into there were told to mind their own business and, and nothing that I'm aware of ever came to fruition from those records. Of course, the lack of records is the the main reason that uh, a lot of people don't believe the story. Stan Friedman comes to mind. The fact that Bob can't prove that he went to school, the places where he claims he got earned degrees. We're going to get into that as soon as we come back from this break. I'm George Knapp. Uh, stay with us for more of Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. My guests, Gene Huff and John Lear, talking about the origins of the Area 51 story and Bob Lazar. Um, I remember uh, 20 years ago tonight, you guys were out in the desert. You saw one of these discs being test flown, and uh, Bob was the guy who told you about it. And then uh, a month or so, two months after that, sometime in May, Bob went on the air at KLAS TV, uh, blacked out his face. He used the pseudonym Dennis, which was uh, sort of a, a twisted little shot at his boss, Dennis Mariani, uh, the guy who uh, sort of uh, was in charge of him out there. And uh, life was never the same. He told the basic story in a four- or five-minute interview. Uh, we started working on a much larger special after that, and, and things were very different. But I remember in the, first, uh, the very first story we ever aired in November of that year, where we revealed Bob's uh, true name and identity, um, we mentioned that you know his claims of educational credentials, MIT, 
and uh, Caltech that we could not verify that. And, you know, subsequently, a lot of people have come forward to say, aha, uh, there's no records that he ever went to those shows. Uh, Stan Friedman comes to mind. I, I give uh, Stan a lot of credit for actually doing the legwork himself and, and checking it out. Uh, but the fact is that we reported that in the very first story where Bob Lazar's name was ever used. It is troubling uh, to me and I'm sure to you guys that he can't prove that he went to those schools. I, I know we all must harbor some doubts about whether he ever did go to those schools, why he would lie about it. I personally uh, have great uh, doubts about it for, the, for a simple reason. Not because there's no, uh, there are no records, but because I can't imagine Bob sitting through other kinds of classes that it would be required to get a degree at any school, English Lit or something like that. I can see him sitting through science classes, electronics classes, but not the other kinds of things he'd have to sit through. Gene, why don't you start it there? You've answered this stuff before. Is it possible that Bob just uh, exaggerated his credentials in order to get a great job? Well, I don't know that he needed those credentials to get the job. And, I mean, our, you know, he got the job, the, at least the one job we know of down at Los Alamos through Kirk Meyer, which is a headhunter that provides uh, people, you know, for, for technical and scientific positions at Los Alamos and other national labs. So are they all so stupid that Bob told them, oh, yeah, I've got a couple of master's degrees? They said, oh, okay, well, here, you, uh, we'll hire you as a senior staff physicist and you go do this job. Certainly, for he had clearance. I mean, there's evidence that he had security clearance. So the people that did his security clearance are so stupid. You know what I mean? I don't know that he needed those degrees to get those jobs. If anything, I think he exaggerated it after the fact for ego reasons or whatever. I mean, if he did, it's unfortunate because I truly believe that he worked on flying discs at S4 and if people are dismissing the story because of his lack of educational credentials, then it was a tragic, tragic mistake. But no one said you needed two master's degrees to have any of the jobs he's held at Los Alamos or at S4. But wouldn't you say, I mean, the argument being, and John, maybe you can tackle this, uh, gosh, you'd have to have degrees. You'd have to have a, be a really smart guy, and they'd only pick the best scientists. Well, I guess we covered this partly before, but it's got to bother you as well. You know Bob real well. Uh, do you harbor questions about whether he really went to those schools or not? No, I don't, uh, because when he came over with Gene, he had a, a resume with him, and there was copies both of his degree from MIT and uh, Caltech. And I asked him when he went there, because uh, this guy, uh, Tom Mahood, did a timeline, and uh, Bob said that, uh, that um, Los Alamos had sent him there. Now, I have no doubt about that. But I don't know how the timeline works. I don't know how <clears throat> how he could have fit it in. Well, I don't. I don't. I'm not saying he didn't go to those schools. But the question is, did he graduate with a master's degree? And what what courses could have transferred from one program to another? I mean, that's a co complex scenario. I mean, if you have two master's degrees, it doesn't mean you went from your freshman through. Uh, you know, six years of college for each one, taking all those classes individually. So it's a complex, it's a complex paradigm to say that he's got the two master's degrees. And but you know, we, you know, I've discussed this with a lot of people, and and the one thing that we, those of, who've been around Bob and John, you know this, he is a comprehensive problem solver. I mean, not only does he understand physics, he understands electronics, he under he understands a lot of things. He is he's a jack of all trades and master of quite a number. It's not, you know, ma not master of none. He he's he's a master in electronics. I mean, uh, he's fixed audio file stereo equipment for me and said, look, I did this for you, but don't tell anybody I can do this because I don't want to be fixing everybody's <laughs> stereo equipment. And uh, so, you know, we tried to, I and others have tried to resolve who were they looking for for that program at S4. I mean, there's nothing really, they were learning science and from physics that didn't really exist with materials that didn't even exist you know, commonly on Earth. And so is there any background or other job that would have prepared you for back engineering discs from another planet? And and what degree and, and what uh, 
what importance did they place on what? In, in other words, uh, your background, your educational credentials, how about whether you could take it? I mean, a lot of people, uh, a dev devoutly religious person, wouldn't want to hear uh, some of the things Bob read in those reports. Uh, again, who, who, who could they trust? Who would help them? Who could they trust or who could they uh, discredit if they uh, – couldn't trust them. I think the the criteria was a lot more than you know. You've got these. Look, if they just wanted people with uh, master's degrees, they could have had any number of PhDs in the entire world would have given their right arm to be in that program. So that simply couldn't be the criteria. Well, you know, for me, the linchpin uh, of his credibility was always Los Alamos. If he worked at Los Alamos Lab and sensitive or classified uh, capabilities, that that uh, it was entirely plausible that he could be pulled into a program at Area 51 or S4. And I don't think there's any question. In fact, there's no question in my mind that he really was at Los Alamos. Right. I remember the time that he took us there on a weekend and, and we went in. And you know, uh, he waved. He tape of that tour and he went any, any place he wanted, right? Yeah, he walked, waved at the guard. He took us in. Uh, it was like a rabbit going through its own burrow, zipping <laughs> through these buildings and stuff. He knew his way around, waved at people. We brought a video camera in, as you mentioned, John, and, and uh, nobody stopped us. We took video of that, and it was pretty clear he knew his way around the place. He was in the phone book, uh, but still, uh, that's not enough. I mean, people, well, that doesn't prove he worked at S4. If he was at S4, it doesn't prove he worked on saucers. It's it's part of the reason why Bob doesn't really like to talk about this stuff anymore, because there's always going to be another round of questions. Is that is this not true of anyone if someone worked on a, a terrestrial uh, program? I mean, did are they allowed to take home evidence? And if they worked there, did they work on that craft? Does that craft exist? I mean, can, forget Bob Lazar. Can some man who's working out in central Nevada on uh, whatever our newest spy plane is right now, is is he allowed to prove that he's working on that? And, and how does he do that? Let's talk about element 115. This is the magical uh, element that Bob said was used to power these uh, flying saucers. John, um, give me your take on 115. Give me your take on 115. I know that uh, there, there's a story that Bob stole some from S4 and brought it home, which is an incorrect assumption on the part of uh, a lot of people. But you got to see this stuff and, and what it could do in a fairly interesting experiment involving a cloud chamber, right? Yeah, we took a... Um regular bell jar and uh, some dry ice and we put the um, uh, the element 115 it was in the little it, we, we didn't steal it. it somebody gave it to him from uh, Los Alamos and we put out the story that he stole it so we wouldn't implicate the guy that gave us from gave it to us from uh, Los Alamos John wasn't that code name like LA 1000 or something like that yeah something like that anyway put the uh, with a 115 on the dry ice and then we hug uh, hung the um, Coleman lantern mantle, which uh, has thorium in it, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the gist of the experiment, the, uh, the reason we did that was to see the attractive properties of 115. Could it deflect the alpha particles coming, uh, being emitted from the thorium emitter? Uh, and, uh, and it did. We videotaped it. And uh, the cloud chamber, you know, the, the dry ice made the uh, the cloud so that we could see the particles and what direction they're going. And of course, they're going straight out at a million miles an hour, and uh, there's nothing that should deflect them. But in fact, the uh, uh, the particles, uh, at least one of them, was deflected, and we caught that on videotape. Now the question is, where is the videotape? Now, <laughs> I know that Bob oh. has a copy, and uh, you had a copy, and it's like many things in this stuff. They just seem to disappear. All the really hard evidence disappears. John, well, I've got it somewhere. I, I just don't know where it is in this big one, pile of stuff. Was the 115 still inside of that clamshell holder during this experiment? The little lead thing that we that yeah. Bob made? Yeah. Well, he took it out of there. No, there, no, there was a, a clam shell that it actually came in because it had to be kept under neutron bombardment when it was at rest. I mean, it, it was a, it wasn't just a little thing that Bob made. Remember, well, I, the, the, well there was a lead container that Bob kept the uh, the one fifteen. I don't know about the clam shell thing, yeah. but the, there was a clam shell thing with whatever whatever neutron emitter. Uh, on the inside of it, I don't know. What, you know, I'm not a scientist. I don't know what I'm talking about. But I know the 115 had to be kept under neutron bombardment at rest for whatever reason, and and there was a casing 
that it came in. I mean, I don't know that that's the same one you're talking about. I, I didn't. Wondering. I didn't see the case. Okay. I just saw the little arrowhead shape. Okay. That put on the dry ice, and there was me, Joe Vaninetti, right. and Bob, and uh, Bob, and I think Jim Taliani was there. Gene, did you ever see 115 out of the case? No, not out of the case. Um, I saw you, the case. Though. You, you've heard the stories about well, – I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll hold this till after the break. But I want to go into the stories about uh, 115 because it's now a real element. It wasn't back then. It came out of the sky, an appropriate uh, song for this time period. We'll be back with more of Gene Huff and John Lear and maybe a call from Bob Lazar. We still have our fingers crossed. I'm George Knapp. This is Coast to Coast AM. We're talking with John Lear and Gene Huff about the early days of the Area 51 story, how it all came about. In particular, one of the linchpins of the story is this mysterious, magical element called 115. At the time the Bob Lazar first mentioned it to me, uh, I was no scientist, but I was smart enough to know that uh, the periodic table didn't go that high. There was no such thing. Now, there is. Uh, however, the 115 that's been created in a lab is far different from what Bob Lazar described back then. When we come back, we'll pick up the conversation there about uh, what they saw with what the 115 and we might even get into where that piece of stuff is now. Stay with us for more Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. My name is George Knapp. We're talking with John Lear and Gene Huff about the Area 51 story, the Bob Lazar story. And a, a key factor in that story is the, sto is the information about something called Element 115. I as I mentioned uh, before that break, uh, I had first been told about it and said, uh, well, it doesn't exist, Bob. And he comes back and says, well, it's theorized that there is an island of stability, that uh, that something like this could exist. And, and of course, now it has been created in a lab, uh, but it's uh, it only lasted for a couple of seconds. Gene, how do you reconcile Bob's uh, version of what 115 is like, stable, 500 pounds of this stuff, with uh, the reality of what scientists have found? found? Well, I'm... <laughs> Not that I'm much of a judge, I mean, from a layman's point of view. First of all, remember, 500 pounds isn't a, a room full. This is a, a, a an element heavier than lead, so 500 pounds isn't, you know, isn't as much as one would surmise. And um, uh, all I know about it is it had, to, it, it had to be, it wasn't just 115. I believe it was an isotope of 115, and it, I remember it had to be kept under neutron bombardment at rest because it would be inside this reactor in the disk. It would be, uh, they'd actually bombard it with, uh, a, I think, a proton, wasn't it, John, that was sent down a, a tuned tube uh, of, uh, to, uh, uh, to actually plug into the nucleus of the 115, which would then... Uh, Pump it up to 116. Yeah, make it 116, and 116. then it would fission yeah. off some particles, some of which were antimatter and this antimatter would be reacted with matter, and uh, then the heat from that reaction would be converted to electricity, and this is how the disk was powered. So that's the basic, that's the basic story of 115. And in, in, uh, even back then in Van Nostrand's uh, Scientific Encyclopedia, I think it was the, um, the lab for heavy ion research or something like that at Darmstadt, Germany, had done some research, and, and they were sneaking up on 115, but hadn't created it. And, and since then, uh, they, yes, they have created some 115 in a lab, but if you, if you actually examine how they do some of these experiments, I mean, they'll bombard this and bombard that and move particles at a significant percentage of the speed of light and then use this filter or that filter, and, and, and so it had to exist and then exist for X amount of, seconds or fractions of seconds, and then it decays. So no one had enough of it, a quantity of it, that they could actually study it and do anything with it, even though they have not only found that it, it does exist, it's not just a theory, there, there is a, an island of stability there, but they, what they found is that it, uh, it decays rapidly. But again, the 115 Bob worked with wasn't just 115 like hydrogen is hydrogen, it was an isotope, and there were special properties involved with it, including how you had to keep it when it, when it wasn't in action. I remember uh, during that tumultuous period when Bob thought uh, maybe his life was in danger, going to his house one night, and he had the 115 in, in that uh, lead casing, sort of uh, with a bullseye on it, in front of his uh, particle accelerator. Right. Uh, so the uh, what was he doing there? 
I guess the threat was that he would uh, accelerate particles down and plug in a proton into the into the uh, one of the. Uh, I don't know if he would have been able to achieve the speed or the power to do that, but I doubt that somebody at the OFI would know whether he had that capability or not. And I guess it was a threat to cause an antimatter reaction explosion. I Meaning guess. if they were going to take him out, he was going to take them out. Everybody was going at the same time, right. John, uh, you, you buy the stuff, the story on 115 based on what you saw with that cloud chamber experiment. Yeah, and uh, the fact is the, uh, uh, the 115... Uh, was stable. There is an island of stability up there, but 116 is not. And what they were doing is bumping the 115 up to 116 by uh, injecting protons into it. And what it would do is when it got to 116, it would immediately decay. And, uh, and what would happen is uh, during the decay, it would throw off antimatter, which was mixed with matter to create heat, to create power for the, uh, 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 for the ship. And the other was they could access the gravity A wave uh, and the gravity A wave they use to uh, access and amplify, amplify it to pull space towards them to go hundreds of light years, you know, in a very short second. But um, naturally occurring element with 15 cannot uh, be found uh, anywhere near us. It can only be found in a solar system much larger. Is the way Bob explained it, uh, the, the two main factors which determine the residual matter that remain after the creation uh, of a solar system is the amount of electromagnetic energy and the amount of mass present at the time of the creation of that solar system. A much larger solar system than the one Earth is in would have to have been created to have element uh, 115 occurring as a natural element. So, no, there's no possibility that uh, uh, it's here or it could be mined here, which some people have said, uh, and there's no possibility that they could actually make it. It would take years and years and years of, of uh, pumping uh, protons and years of electromagnetic energy to to make the element 115 that uh, that Bob had. There's there's had. a there's a story that uh, of something that happened that hasn't really been told that you guys have not discussed in public. But at one point, uh, this uh, piece that that Bob had was stolen, wasn't it? There was three, and two were two were stolen. Bear me out on this, Gene, and then uh, and then uh, one we have no comment on. <laughs> Gene, uh, the the who's who stole it? Who stole this? Like the, the in the piece. You know, I just have a vague memory of that. I don't remember who did steal that, John. You know, I remember like trying to know. cut a deal to recover <laughs> it, and uh, actually Bob Bigelow was actually involved in that, but I don't want to, I, I don't remember, uh, I don't, don't remember who the guy was that took it or how he got access to it. By the way, with all that stuff John rattled off there with gravity, A waves, and blah, 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 blah. We, before you take callers from the public, we know that Earth scientists do not agree that gravity is a wave, and we know that there be, should be so much waste heat from an antimatter reaction and a little reactor inside of a flying disk that everything would melt, and, and, and we understand that. I mean, we're not, we're not uh, scientists, and, and we can't answer those questions as where did all the waste heat go and, our, and the arguments about gravity being a wave. Just for the record. <laughs> okay. Well, I remember that there was uh, th that uh, one of the pieces was stolen, and I thought it was like a neighbor or a friend or a hanger-on who was uh, uh, at the house and was interested in all the UFO stuff who right. took it, and somehow you got it back. But, uh, and yeah, then, and uh, I just don't remember his name or how that came about because, I, I, you know, I remember Bob was real upset that it happened, and we had to try and cut a deal to get it back and go meet with a guy, and we were setting a meeting out at the the old Las Vegas Speedway, not the new one, the old one over in northeast part of town there and all of that. And and, uh, but, and I don't want to start. I don't remember the names and, and how okay. it happened. So, um, What happened to the piece? I mean, you know uh, you know what happened to it. Can you, can you say? How much can you say? Well, you know, it was, you know, he buried it at a place where... <laughs> where it would be hard for anybody to get yeah, it. it would be hard to get to get and uh, and the, but it would be secure at that uh, at that location for a long time it would be obvious if it if it's uh, if it's containment was ever jeopardized so basically you know uh it's known it's known where that uh, that that piece is yeah yeah uh speaking of elements By the way, uh, it's not it's not it's not like i could drive there and go pick it up right. or, or i would right 
Uh, speaking of strange elements, the element polonium surfaces later, much later in the Bob Lazar story. Uh, of course, after this UFO stuff, Bob tries to leave all of it behind, doesn't want to talk about it anymore, starts up a scientific supply business online, United Nuclear, and, and sells all kinds of weird stuff to, to schools and labs. And one of the things that he sold was uh, something called polonium. And it uh, surfaced in a major news story a uh, year or so ago, two years ago, when a Russian spy was killed, um, presumably through the use of polonium. And news organizations start uh, looking around to see uh, where could somebody get polonium and whose name comes up. Bob Lazar, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, how'd, the, how'd that work out? Well, you know, he always had things like that around. I remember him talking about polonium. and In fact, he had ordered some polonium and beryllium from a, a scientific supply place a long time ago. And uh, a guy from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission came by Bob's house and wanted to know why he wanted polonium and beryllium because those are actuators, like like I know what I'm talking about here, they're actuators in, in the nuclear explosion in an atomic bomb. Polonium and beryllium are actuators of some sort. So when he, he ordered some and tried to buy some back then, the uh, NRC sent a guy by his house who really knew what he was talking about, and Bob couldn't talk his way out of it because the guy said, well, for what you need, you can use these other things. You don't need polonium and beryllium because Bob had a pseudo purpose other than whatever he wanted it for. And so then when he opened up his own scientific supply place, he found a supplier of it. But we're talking about, you know, uh, it's just so they can use it to detect it with Geiger counters. I mean, you could fit the amount he's selling uh, would fit on the head of a pin. So it's not a quantity of it. Let's talk about uh, broad strokes here. We've got a couple of minutes left before we open up the phone lines. Uh, did you, uh, first uh, you, John, and then Eugene, did you have any idea at the time that this was going to become this big? I mean, the Area 51 story is sort of a phenomenon. It's known all over the world. Uh, they, You know, books and movies and things of that sort and T-shirts and ashtrays and trinkets and posters. And, um, you know, it's been featured on all kinds of TV shows and uh, in all kinds of articles in the UFO field and beyond. Did you have any idea how big it would get back then? Well, first of all, you said a couple months after he did the uh, the thing in silhouette. I think it was the week after because we did that on the record, and uh, and you said the phone was ringing off the hook, and it was the next day that you had Bob uh, do the silhouette interview, and then the day after that that you came up here with Bob Stoldow and uh, interviewed Bob to uh, to uh, to find out what his credibility was. <clears throat> but the answer to what I thought. Uh, I honestly believe that after he did that interview in Silhouette, that the story would break worldwide and everybody would know that we had flying saucers and aliens were visiting us and everything. I honestly believe that. I did too, George. I I, I, I thought we were seeing a, a change in the world. In fact, I would tell Bob, before it ever went public, I'd, I'd say, boy, you know, this would make a great screenplay. And, um, in fact, right after he got caught uh, – I was going to put uh, material together uh, to write a book, and he knew I had done some screenwriting in the past and gone to screenwriting lectures and courses and things like that. And he said, don't don't write a book. Why don't you write a screenplay? And like you said, I wrote the screenplay. And, of course, that movie's all, all almost been made four or five times now, but all, always falls through for uh, whatever, through the millions of normal Hollywood reasons. And uh, But, yes, I did think. Uh, this, in fact, uh, I was talking to John today when Bob was in the program and when he started telling us some things and when uh, it looked, when when he started hinting around about taking us out to see the disc test, uh, he'd tell me about being with his partner and I'd say, well, what's his name? And he goes, I don't know. And I'd say, well, don't they have those name tags on just like you have that you pick up when you go to work? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, if I were you, I'd start noticing some people's names just in case things go bad, and because and Bob's got a bad memory anyway. And, and he would work there and be so absorbed in what he was working on, uh, you know, he'd see a number of people with name badges on and wouldn't even notice what their names were. And uh, so, yeah, I, I, I convinced him to start looking at people's names because I did think this would be a worldwide story, and, and it would certainly be helpful if you could locate any of these other people to corroborate what Bob was saying. I guess uh, you didn't weren't thinking about the marketing potential immediately. I mean, you thought about a screenplay, but good gosh, this thing is no, no, a cottage industry. It's gone in so many different directions, and 
and all over the world. In fact, John and I just said today that there's nobody on this planet that has made less money from ufology than me and John Leary. <laughs> Everybody in the world has sold videos and books and uh, everything <laughs> in the world. We, we haven't made a cent. And you were there in the beginning. Right, right. Well, how, how has it changed your lives? Um, you know, John, you pretty much believe that this stuff was possible, and so there was no fundamental shift in your belief system, but it's had to have had an, uh, uh, an effect on your life personally, economically. Yeah, it really was. And, uh, you know, at that time I was working for American Trans Air, and, of course, uh, everybody or, you know, most of the people know that uh, in July of uh, 89, which is a month or two or a couple months after this happened, they called me in and they said, uh, John, you don't really believe this stuff, do you? I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. And they said, well, you know, we can't have a captain flying an L-1011 with passengers who believes in flying saucers. And uh, and that was it for me. Uh, they fired me. And uh, it was probably a good thing that happened because I went to work uh, for the uh, cargo airlines there in uh, Detroit and had a lot of fun, met a, a great bunch of guys and and I really had a career kind of change. Instead of flying, you know, passengers and have to worry about them, I was flying cargo uh, boxes. And, you know, it's all night flying. And it was it was just worked out great for me because I'd rather fly at night and sleep all day long. And, Gene, for you, um, you, you mentioned that this isn't the kind of thing that you cashed in on in any way, but it has had to have a profound effect on how you see the world around you, hasn't well, it? It did. I actually started reading everything I get my hands on. Uh, uh, you know, uh, again, with me, it's the basic of qu questions of man. I, you know, yes, uh, gravity propulsion and uh, antimatter uh, reactors, and that's interesting to a degree. But you know, who are we? Where do we come from? Where are we going to? Life after death? God? You know, the the basic questions of man are what I'm interested in. And and you know, I I think if anything, you know, you know, with knowledge comes unhappiness <laughs> and uh, knowing where we stand on the interstellar food chain and not necessarily believing anymore that you know you know what i mean no, knowing where you stand on the on the interstellar food chain uh and uh, you know i'm pretty much back down to i was born and raised a christian and went to a lutheran grade school and uh you know i'm all the way down to life as a series of chemical reactions and and of of course, uh, the one thing that I think I gained out of it is that I I truly believe. Uh, while I I don't fully really believe, uh, while I I don't believe in you know uh, creation, you know, as opposed to evolution, I don't believe in straight line evolution either. I believe that, and this has gotten around a long way since I grappled with this in the in the uh, late eighties. But I believe that man is a product of externally corrected evolution, which is part of the things Bob and read in those reports out there. In other words, that man's straight-line evolution was intervened by a non-deity catalyst. And so, I, no, I don't think that when the dinosaurs were here, we were some little rodent hiding in the bushes, and we ended up being the human beings we are. I think our evolution has been intervened by at least, you know, who knows how many times, but but certainly by someone from elsewhere. And I think I think ufology, I think UFOs and aliens, uh, which may look like us or may not look like us, are the basis for many of the uh, God, Lord, and angel stories from the Old Testament. And and if you read uh, Zechariah Sitchin's Earth Chronicles and uh, and look at the, the Sumerian writings and and uh, all of that information, I think you you start to get a handle on on how all of the religions and things that really govern this planet, and in some instances ruin this planet, uh, where they came from, and and how things got to be the way they are. So I guess that's a plus. I don't know. Um, it, it, John, anything to elaborate on that? Well, I got a little bit farther than that. Uh, you know, I really believe that. Uh, uh, the entire solar system is inhabited. All the planets are inhabited, uh, including the moon, Venus, Jupiter. They say that the, you know four of the planets are gas giants. The only gas giant we have uh, uh, in this solar system is NASA uh, and his son uh, Jim Obert. <clears throat> but uh, NASA is the only the, gas giant. 
What's did, that? Did you say NASA is the only gas giant? Yeah, NASA <laughs> would be the only gas giant. <laughs> <laughs> Fellas, it's been interesting. We've still got uh, some time to go. We're going to be opening up the phone lines with our listener questions, and I've got a few more of my own, and we might still hear from Bob. I don't know. Stick around, everyone, for more Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp. Welcome back, everyone. My guests, John Lear, Gene Huff, talking about the uh, origins of the Bob Lazar story, Area 51, flying saucers, all of that. I'm going to go to the phone lines in just a second. I do want to touch on one other thing. Uh, Gene, you were talking about how how this has profoundly affected uh, your view of life and universe and where we came from. There was something else that uh, Bob Lazar said he read in uh, some of the documents uh, out at, uh, at Groom Lake. Uh, that is very disturbing. We didn't touch on it before, but it was, and it was tough to get him get out of him, as I recall. And I'm talking about this reference to a harvesting of souls. Do you remember what that was about? I don't think Bob read anything about a harvesting of souls. He read that man was the product of externally corrected evolution, and that man as a species had been genetically altered 65 times. And uh, of course, we we extrapolated that out and said, now, how do you genetically alter a species? Certainly uh, breeding wouldn't do it, especially historically when transportation and, and uh, communication weren't what they are now. So uh, we actually concluded that airborne and waterborne viruses, especially retroviruses, just like AIDS is a retrovirus that goes in and destroys your immune system, if someone, if an advanced intelligence could, uh, you know, do genetic alterations and actually uh, send airborne and waterborne retroviruses out to retrofit anything that uh, has that water and air as a common denominator could then be genetically altered. John, do you recall Bob reading? I mean, I know there's been a lot of info uh, on the harvesting of souls, but did you recall Bob reading that at S4? I don't. No, what he read was uh, that the aliens referred to us as containers. Right. And uh, I was trying to get him to uh, say, well, I think what we contain is souls. He says, no, it didn't say that. He said it could be, uh, okay. you know, what say there's the right genetic information like to be altered or whatever. Just let me say here that since Bob probably isn't going to call in, I'd like to tell uh, our listening audience what I think that he would have said if he'd uh, come on. <laughs> okay. He would have said, um, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't care, I don't recall. <laughs> and any question that starts with, well, John Lear says, Bob would have said, everybody knows John Lear is a nutball. And John Lear is crazy. <laughs> um, but, yeah, on that note, I mean, we have, we all know each other here in Las Vegas, and we have talked about many things that I don't know if they're able to be understood out of context to someone who doesn't know anything about the subject and happens to be listening. So uh, we may have to come back another time and answer a lot more questions uh, because the things we've said beg more questions. And I'd also like to say that Bob really did, was regretful that he, you know, he was supposed to try and call in, but he was in transit over a 2,000-mile trip hauling three horses and three dogs and three cats and furniture and a four-vehicle caravan. And uh, it's not like this was, you know, some ploy to get people to listen that Bob Lazar might call in. I'm, I'm certain we can get him to join us another night when he's not in the middle of a cross-country move. Oh, well put then. We're going to go to the phones, our international line, Greg in Ontario. Hi, Greg. How you doing? Pretty good. How are you? Okay. What's on your mind? Um, first off, I, I just wanted to congratulate uh, your guests on uh, having the spine to express these kind of views, especially for people with a professional background like a pilot. Uh, some people tend not to take these kind of things seriously. Um, what I wanted to ask, though, was if you gentlemen believe that faster than light travel is possible, something along the lines of uh, how it's depicted in Star Trek, for example. No doubt about it. How is it depicted in Star Trek? Well, in well, Star Mike. Trek, it's depicted as just a, an engineering exercise, and uh, we don't have the engineering expertise yet. Well, yeah, uh, I, see- I actually... I'd say I'm we sorry? do believe that that's what Bob Lazar learned is that distorting space and time rather than flying at a significant percentage of the speed of the light in a straight line in a linear mode, they actually distort the space and time that you're, that between you and your destination. Uh, uh, similar, I guess, to creating an artificial wormhole. Would that be a good radio demonstration i don't know but yes that you can distort space and time and ultimately you did travel faster than the speed of light 
although you never flew faster than the speed of light in a straight line. Does John, you want to tackle that as well? Yeah, it does. John, you want to tackle that as well? Well, basically, um, uh, we think as, um, as outer space, space is, is a nothing, that uh, it's just a cold thing, nothing's there. Actually, uh, uh, one cubic meter of uh, space contains one hydrogen atom. Uh, it's actually a fabric. You could take this and push it and pull it and, and distort it. What they do with the gravity amplifiers is to pull that space towards them, wrap it around the craft, turn the gravity generator off, and then you're instantaneously hundreds and thousands of miles uh, away from where you you pulled that space. You unite, you unite or coalesce or join with that particular uh, piece of space. And what they can do is uh, <clears throat> recycle that generator every 12 milliseconds. So if you can travel hundreds of thousands of miles every 12 milliseconds, uh, <clears throat> and you you know you multiply that by how many milliseconds are in how many 12 milliseconds are in a second. Uh, then times a minute, then times a day and a year, you can go a pretty long distance in a pretty short time. By the way, Earth scientists know that they know that gravity distorts space and time. That's how we, the, you know, the, the old experiment they did where you could see, see stars behind the sun during an eclipse. That's a famous experiment. So they, you know, we know that, that gravity distorts space and time. What we don't know is how you can generate an artificial gravitational field. And this is the info that the aliens brought, how you can, when you can do that, you can distort space and time into a much greater degree than that, you know, caused by a star or a planet. Greg, thanks for that call. We need to take a break right now. We'll come back with more of your calls for John Lear and Gene Huff right after this. Stay with us. I'm George Knapp on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back, everyone. I'm George Knapp. This is Coast to Coast AM talking with Gene Huff and John Lear about uh, Area 51. Bob Lazar, flying saucers. You know the story. We're going to go to the phone lines east to the Rockies, Davis in Kentucky. Good morning, Davis. Good morning, gentlemen, and bless you all. I was thinking back. It, it's been years ago, but Art had, I thought, Bob on, and they were talking about the 118 element, and somebody called in and said that uh, there was a, a Microsoft encyclopedia that you can buy called Encarta or something like that, that in the physics section, 1976 or something, there was, there was an article in there about that. Uh, and apparently it had been discovered on a meteorite that came in, you know, naturally, and uh, some other elements had been discovered. Uh, I, I, I don't have the article. I don't, you know, don't have that kind of money to buy that. But anyway, uh, this guy described that uh, they discovered up through 120, through 124 naturally on Earth, someplace in Africa, through spectral, you know, technology. I don't know. Um, leave it out there with you. I've never heard, heard that, and uh, I would think that would be some of the biggest news in the scientific community. I've never heard a whisper of it. Have you, John, or George? No, that's, I, that's impossible, not on Earth. It has to be a solar system. Well, he much, said it came in on a meteorite. So. Well, that's interesting. Maybe we'll have to look for that yeah. uh, that article and see see what the origin of the story is. But I'd for appreciate... it to be, to be stable and have a handful of it in a meteorite, I, I have my doubts that that's probably accurate, but... Maybe it's a it's, maybe there's a piece of truth there, and it's just a little mixed up. Thanks, Davis. Appreciate it. West of the Rockies, Dale from here in Las Vegas. Hi, Dale. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering. I've read the stories about the flying saucer that Bob Lazar observed, and I'm wondering where are they now? And if the government has them, why wouldn't they use them? Because I can imagine all kinds of good uses for them. Where do you think they are? John, do you think they're at the new Area 51 you were I talking about? I think they're about? probably at the new Area 51. I don't think they'd use them. Uh, they're very careful uh, with, uh, you know, what they do with them. I don't think that uh, we use them for, like, going anywhere or transporting. I think they're still studying them. And if they can glean any technology from it, they're going to use it on a craft or in any 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 capacity that would look normal to any you know, Earthling, if they, if, if they don't fly the craft themselves, if they learn something from the craft that can be used in another craft of a more acceptable shape so you could operate it in broad daylight 
without uh, being under suspicion, that that is probably what they do. Who knows? They might be using them for something they haven't told us about. I suppose right. if you used them, as a, for example, in a, in a war, in a theater of war. Well, the technology and, that uh, Bob worked on with, with those flying saucers is certainly far advanced. We have our own anti-grav technology, which we developed between 1953 and 1955. My father uh, was a major contractor on that development and uh, uh, through his company, Lear Incorporated. So, you know, we had anti-grav, a form of it, in uh, 1955. That's why you never see anything in the news on how we're progressing on anti-grav. We already have it, but it's a secret. I guess the, the danger would be if you use it, like in a war, and somebody gets it's shot down, then you got some explaining to do. Thanks, Dale. Thanks for the call. First-time caller, Robert, in Arizona. Hi, Robert. Hey, uh, Mr. Knapp and your guest, uh, good evening to you. Thank good you evening. for taking my call. Sure thing. In 2004, when Bob Bazaar was on Coast to Coast Radio with Art Bell, the night he uh, talked about Element 115, he mentioned at the last of the hour of the interview, and before they uh, went on the news break, and nobody ever did a follow-up on this, but he said that when Element 115 was, before it was uh, fired up in the reactor, he said that a gas was introduced into the reactor. In the next hour when calls were taken, nobody ever asked what that gas was. Now, well, the gas was, was just, the gas was just the matter that the antimatter interacts with. There's, it's put in a tuned tube. The, the antimatter, like I know this, I'm just saying this is a, <laughs> As Bob has told me in the past, the after the after the 115 is bombarded, this is all a closed system. The 115 is bombarded, turns to 116, it decays, releases antimatter. The antimatter travels down a tuned tube, meaning I guess what's a tuned tube? Whatever forces, magnetism, electromagnetic, so it doesn't explode because the tube itself is made out of matter. Okay, so it travels down a tuned tube and it, it interacts the matter that it interacts with to cause the antimatter matter explosion from which the heat is turned to electricity, that matter is gas. That's what the gas is. So I don't think it probably, you know, I don't know what gas that was. It could be hydrogen. It could be anything. It, it's just that's the matter target that the antimatter explodes with. Does that answer your question, Robert? Uh, Robert's gone. We're going to move on. Our wild card line, Roland in Boise, Idaho. How you doing, Roland? Hello, Roland, are you there? I'm here, George. Uh, What's on your mind? Well, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Uh, and I've, I've, um, I'm proud to say that I've uh, uh, read transcripts of all your interviews with uh, Bob Lazar over the years, and uh, so I've kind of started this back in the late 70s. And uh, I've, basically I'm calling to defend uh, his position, uh, uh, Lazar's position, uh, that he's a tech head guy, not a, you know, not a, not a politician, so uh, he knows his tech. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to bring up was that if there's standalone uh, energy production, like Bob indicates with his with the technology, uh, what would that do to the world of, of economics today? When you look at Exxon Mobil, who's uh, produced record profits uh, more than any other company in any other industry ever over the past you know uh, year or so. Uh, these people would not want a standalone energy producer that uh, can power cars, uh, electric for homes and, and factories. Uh, they've got a good thing going, on and they're not going to uh, allow the status quo to be disrupted. So that's why I'm saying that we, when you see some of the the, the movies where you know people's uh, identities are all messed up and credit cards are deleted and things like that. Uh, these people have the power to do that, and I think that's exactly what they've done to Bob Lazar. But uh, would either John or uh, uh, Gene? Mr. Uh, uh, Huff care to expound on how uh, this standalone energy might affect our world of economics today? John, you want to tackle that one? Yeah, of course. Uh, it would. Uh, it would. Uh, everything would collapse if we were able to use all that. It's the same thing with oil. Oil is uh, abiogenic, which means it's self-produced. It's not made of dead dinosaurs. There's plenty of oil all over the place. We have the greatest reserves of oil under the United States. It's just they want us uh, to think that uh, you know that, that we've peaked oil and that we're running out and 
and that we've got to be careful. That's all baloney. We've got all the oil that we we need. Uh, George, I would just say I think this gentleman's right. I mean, the essence of that is where there where there are people, uh, there are problems. There's greed and, uh, and other concerns, and so cash yes, cow. something fantastic that could be a wonder for all of us to grasp and enjoy in our lives could very well be kept from us because of greed, as tragic as that is. So I think he's absolutely right. Well, if it's real, if the technology exists and we've got it, uh, you know, that that might be a very plausible reason for the cover-up is just to not to upset the economic apple cart. Thanks for the call, Roland. Wild Card 2 line, Bill in Texas. Hi, Bill. Hey, George. How are you doing? Okay. Wonderful show tonight. Thanks. You have a comment and a question for your guest. Uh, earlier I was listening to you well, several years ago, I guess, and they were talking about when uh, Jackie Gleason went to Homestead Air Force Base with uh, President Nixon at the time to view uh, dead alien bodies. That's the story. And anyway, just as a uh, curiosity feature, I was stationed there about that time. Of course, I didn't see any dead alien bodies, but there were some. Uh, there was one story of uh, the – Southern Miami area and Homestead Air Force Base being uh, hovered over by uh, UFOs two particular nights, and they sent you know uh, aircraft up to investigate. And I don't know what became of that, but uh, anyway, I did get on Google and Googled that and, and checked that because I was unaware of uh, Jackie Gleason going down there to check that out. But it was I found that very interesting. And my question is, what do your guests feel? As to 2012, uh, what do you think? Uh, what do they think might happen? if anything at all, and I'll hang up and listen to the responses. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. Let me take that. It's sure right. baloney. There is no Planet X. There is no Nibiru, and if there is, it's not going to cause any uh, any problem. Uh, whoever is running the show here wants to keep us in a state of anxiety and, and worry and, uh, oh, yeah, the world's going to end, but all that's baloney. By the way, if come read, and go, uh, it's just like every other day that's been. By the way, if you read, uh, if you're referring, you're referring to Nibiru and the Anunnaki from Zechariah Sitchin. If uh, you read Zechariah Sitchin's new last book of that Earth Chronicle series, End of Days, I got some bad news for people like me who were hoping that it would be close enough. First of all, if the if the gods of Eden of all, if, you know, they don't need to wait for Nibiru to get back here. They could fly here <laughs> if they just wanted to come here, so they don't need to wait uh, if that uh, planet exists in a, in a, in a comet 3,600-year uh, orbit around our sun. Uh, though the Anunnaki do not need to wait uh, until it gets close so they could visit the Earth, certainly if they had that type of technology thousands of years ago. They certainly have it now. And secondly, the way... Sitchin has that orbit figured is it's not going to be in the same proximity to the Earth as it was, uh, you know, 2,000 years ago uh, for till like the year 2,900. So in 2012, if you're basing that on the Zechariah Sitchin calendar, absolutely nothing is going to happen. You know, I remember uh, vaguely uh, something about a Project Looking Glass that Bob had talked about and read something about it in these documents, some sort of a, a, a machine that where you could peek see into back the future. In time. Yeah. See back in time? Could you see forward? Uh, that one was just about seeing seeing back in time. And, and, I, and he, it, it was just another, there were other projects going on. He was in Project Galileo. That was the project, or what it was called then, with the back engineering of the disk. There was another one with a, gravity, a, a beam weapon, I think with a gravity lens, if I remember right, called Project Sidekick. And uh, then the other one was Project Looking at Glass, which was a method of seeing back in time. And, again, we think of seeing back time in time as going back and seeing who shot JFK. Right. But seeing back in time for scientists, just being able to see back two or three seconds could make a big difference. So. All right. Uh, stay with us. More of your questions for Gene Huff and John Lear on Coast to Coast AM. I'm George Knapp. Stick around, everyone. Hey, welcome back, everyone. We're uh, having a conversation with Gene Huff and John Lear about the events of 20 years ago, how this whole Area 51 story got started, uh, getting some interesting uh, personal insight into what it was like to live through those times and some details on things that happened back then uh, that maybe you hadn't heard about before, even though the general story is very familiar. We'll come back and take as many of your calls as we can fit in uh, in the home stretch of this show. Stay with us for more Coast to Coast AM. 
Welcome back. I'm George Knapp. This is Coast to Coast AM. We are in the home stretch with our guests, Gene Huff and John Lear. We'll get as many of your questions in as we can. We're going to Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Ed is standing by on our wild card line. Hi, Ed. Hi there, George. Good morning. Good morning uh, to you. What's on all, your mind? Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank you, the three of you, for all the work you've done in, and in this in this topic. You've brought it to reality, to this earth, and you saved Bob Lazar's life, practically. And um, I think that should be, the world should be indebted to you, all three of you, in that sense. I use uh, a lot for it also, George. Um, a line of levity, 20 years ago, I was watching Joan Rivers on a Tonight Show episode, and she made a UFO joke that I thought was hysterically funny, and I want to share it. Okay. She said, she said you'll never see a UFO land on the Jewish front lawn. And the audience laughed, and she said, because they threw it over. Turn it over to see who manufactured it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I have a question. It's a compound. Um, is element 115, like, manufactured by any corporation? Is it regulated by the government? And I have another question also after that, if I may. Okay. Gene? I'm ready. Uh, his question is, uh, is Element 115 manufactured by the government or anybody else? I, I think the answer probably is, uh, you know, they, it's made and they tried to synthesize some of it yeah, in a lab. Yeah, if they're synthesizing it, it, it happens in, in labs in government laboratories in Europe and the United States. Uh, you know, they, all, they get their funding from governments. I'm not aware of any private endeavors, but they wouldn't necessarily call me and tell me they were working on it. So I don't know if it's done privately or not. I, I don't think anyone's created enough of it to be able to even study it so i, I really don't have an answer yeah i Gene, agree uh, it cannot be uh, it cannot be uh, made it naturally occurring element and that can only occur in large 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 solar systems uh, gene wasn't there a time when some one of these labs these heavy ion labs that you referenced earlier they were contacting bob for information about 115 even though you know he's a non-scientist and a phony and all that stuff in the view <laughs> of a lot of people yeah some scientists from Germany, they had about a hundred page formula, literally a hundred pages of a physics formula all about 115. And, uh, you know, it, it was, it was gibberish to me, you know, I mean, I, you know, I was, I was lost. I, I, I joked, I, if I had told Bob, I, if I were him, I'd put time zero equals zero at the end of it. That's how complex it was. And, and our second, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. And, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, there, there are, there are people there are people who firmly believe there's an island of stability, and certainly with isotopes that there will be uh, that, that uh, heavy stable elements do occur elsewhere. Uh, it's just like John said before, the amount of energy, the cost to synthesize it would exhaust the planet. I mean, it'll, it'll never be synthesized in any quantity. What was the second question? Is that caller still there? Guess not. West of the Rockies, uh, Jeff in California. Hi, Jeff. Calling from Albion, California, and listening on KKOH 780 AM, uh, home of Ross Mitchell out of Reno, Nevada. And, uh, John, I'm curious as to how you came up with the infamous John Lear test and how much of that Bob Lazar was attributable to that. And also, what was your um, opinion of Art Bell's response to that in, in regards to whether he would reveal that as a public official on the veracity of those issues brought up in that John Lear test? Well, actually, it's just something I wrote up based on information I had. What I'm going to have to do is write Disclosure Test 2.0 <laughs> to bring it up to date with things I have learned since then. What's the John Lear test, John? I don't even know. That was a, a disclosure uh, test that I gave to Art Bell several years ago, and it's all over the, the net. It's based on what I thought was going on, and a lot of it was true, but a lot of it uh, was not. And I've, like I say, I've got to relate. I've got to write the uh, disclosure 2.0, which I haven't gotten around to yet. <laughs> all right. Well, I look forward to reading that then. Thanks for the call. We're going to go to our first time caller line, Thomas in Michigan. Good morning, Thomas. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Gene, you were um, asking about um, connection with God. If you took a look at the book of Psalms and realized that it's a timeline that has been describing events at a rate of a chapter per year for the last hundred years, I think you'd catch on. Take a look at uh, Psalm 74 where it talks about Leviathan. It was in that year that we get raised the Russian K-129 diesel submarine, which sank in 68. 
That thing is the Leviathan. And you take a look at Psalm 68, the chariots of God. He's talking uh, about vehicles coming back here to uh, basically stop a war. Those were the year we sank that submarine. We uh, had missile disruptions throughout the entire uh, United States as Russia because uh, they were getting too close. Well, if, if you that ever makes at sense it? to you and you're at peace with it, then you're you're a lucky man. Okay, well, I think it would be very helpful because, uh, yeah, the Psalms work as a timeline. They explain everything that's going on. We have 9-11 in there. We have the 91 Gulf War in there, World War II, Holocaust, the atomic bomb development in uh, 1945. All the things that you're talking about are being explained to you right out of there. <laughs> I don't think Gene wants to argue with you, uh, the, the point being that, you know, you're, uh, you're good with it, and uh, he sees things differently, but I thank you for the call anyway, Thomas. Thank you. Wild card line, William in Florida. Hi, William. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. My question to uh, all of you, I don't know if it would have come better at the beginning of the show or maybe it's more appropriate at the end. Uh, for years now, as I've, I've observed ufology and the fascination with flying saucers, I always go back to, what's referred to as the original flying saucer sighting by Mr. Kenneth Arnold uh, around Mount Rainier, Washington, June 24, 1947. Um, Mr. Arnold made a comment saying that um, it described a boomerang-shaped object that skipped like a saucer but did not look like a saucer. Flying saucers, from what I've seen, have never been seen prior to him saying flying saucers. And I know several of the gentlemen there are pilots, as am I, and you know that a flying saucer, per se, is a aerodynamically inferior design. Um, if it was a, uh, a good design and it would work aerodynamically, the space shuttle would probably be a flying saucer. I'm very interested in your response to that, and in your opinion, is all this flying saucer stuff, for lack of a better term, um, could it be based on misinformation from the very beginning, from 1947? Well, and first, if, what you're saying isn't true. There are... If you uh, you take a look in in videos and um, books and printed information about uh, things objects in the sky in in antiquity, you know, in centuries past, there are there are saucer shaped objects in in uh, and that people have seen in the sky long before Kenneth Arnold. Yeah, I agree with that. So so what the paradigm you're setting up is not is not correct. The other part of it is, is aerodynamics even a, a factor in uh, building no, a saucer? No, if, if they're not flying through the wind on, <laughs> with a winged aircraft. I, I mean, the, the, uh, the, I don't want to start a moon argument with John, but the, but the moon rovers didn't look like a, a 747 either. You know what I mean? They weren't flying, flying in air in, in our atmosphere. So, Thanks, William. I appreciate the call. Mike in Indiana, also on a wild card line. Good morning, Mike. Morning, guys. And just to add to that previous caller with the disc shape, uh, take a look at a frisbee. They're, they're round. Good point. I got a question for you guys. And I don't know if you're going to have an answer for it or not, uh, but you probably will. Who invented nanotechnology?